Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Are you speaking on agenda or off agenda? Not about an agenda. Thank you. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Mr. Lashley? Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for another wonderful, magnificent day that you have created. And dear Lord, please give us the wisdom and the judgment to make the decisions for the people of Alamance County. And dear Lord, we know that all things are possible in your name. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This would indicate there are seats up here on the front if anybody wants to wants a seat. <laughs> No doubt the bravest man ever. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like being in a hot seat, do you, Tony? <laughs> okay. We have two agendas. Um, well, first off, we need to approve the agenda, and I'm going to ask that one item be removed from the consent agenda. That is the Alcovets vehicle under item number... Um, 6B. The rest of that would stay where it is, but that one vehicle would be removed and placed on the regular business agenda. Uh, I'll make that motion. Does anyone? I'll second that. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any contrary? Or you yes, place it under seven. We're going to move it. Seven dash six, seven seven dash seven. Yeah, let's just do that. We'll move it to seven dash seven. It'll be a new number seven. No, let's not do that. Let's move it to um, let's move it to um, seven dash three. So those folks won't have to hang around. Seven dash three. So all the others will move down. With that amendment, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. In discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Again, unanimous. Okay, we have two speakers um, on agenda. And so, um, Mr. Councilman, Bobby Gann. Where's Bobby? Uh huh. Bobby Please Chan. come forward. Good to see you, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. I was here to speak about item 6B, which you've moved. <laughs> um, I'm Bobby Chen, 386 Carolina Circle, Graham, North Carolina. I'm the secretary of Alcovets. Um, I'm here to speak about the service we provide taking veterans to the VA hospital in Durham. Folks call me, and then I coordinate with our transportation driver uh, Nancy McCoy, who has driven at least one veteran a week for the past year to Durham in her own personal vehicle. 
uh, it's gotten to the point where she will take some veterans who once they get to know her she's taking them repeatedly to the hospital but she's done this all out of the generosity of her heart and for the love of veterans but she's been doing it and incurring the expenses to herself and by us owning having this van from the the county from sheriff johnson then we would license her to drive our van and we would cover the expense of gas and maintenance for that van thank you very much thank you and richard shevlin yes sir good to see you sir richard shevlin i am the vice chair of elko vets i live at 510 wildwood lane I am also here to speak on the subject that was moved. Uh, as the vice chair, we coordinate all hours of the night and all hours of the day to get veterans to and from appointments and sometimes to hospitals or to visits uh, to hotels, whatever they might need. And again, we do it on a personal note uh, and the, the vehicle from Sheriff Johnson would be a godsend. Uh, it, it would relieve the burden of our personal vehicles. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Okay, the other two speakers are non-agenda, so we'll hold off on these speakers. I assume that there are no commissioner responses at this point. Thank you. Okay, um, the consent agenda as amended, we need to approve the consent agenda as amended. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? There being none. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And there are there's no opposition. Okay. We're now down to seven one. And it is with great honor that I am allowed to bring you folks forward. Uh, we have our state senator and our house representative. And the podium is yours. Well, the agenda says it's uh, the county manager. Hey, good. Just presenting this. So please, please proceed. Do we, it's, have uh, a, <laughs> we do a dog and I'll, I'll be the pony. You can do the dog. Absolutely. Absolutely. Please proceed, please. So, uh, Representative Rodell and I are here to commemorate the state budget had a total of uh, over $53 million for the citizens of Alamance County that will come out through um, different municipal governments and to various um, non-governmental organizations. Tonight we're here to commemorate um, the, a few special projects which are going directly to the county coffers and then in some cases out to the volunteer fire departments and other uh, organizations. So this is, I'll introduce Senate, uh, Representative Rydell. <laughs> he hadn't taken your job yet, has he? <laughs> Dennis, I'm not, I'm not sure whether you got a promotion or a demotion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got some bills in the Senate, so I think I'll call it a promotion for now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Amy, and thank you, Chairman Page Lane, Commissioners, everyone uh, who's here. Uh, this was the result of a real good joint effort between Amy and myself working with our budget chairs and the respective House and the Senate. Uh, we spent a good t bit of time with Brian and on the phone and in personal uh, meetings, a lot of time on the phone and in meetings with people from our municipalities and from various uh, nonprofit organizations here in Alamance County. And I'm happy to present, along with Senator Gailey, a check to Alamance County for the amount of 16, $16 million $375,000. For those of you here, you can see that. <laughs> and subject to your approval, I would like for us to be able to just rub elbows with pictures. Do you mind? Not at all. <laughs> Let me just say this covers four different items, $15 million for the Emergency Services Consolidation Project and then another half a million dollars for the diversion center project which we're pleased to see in there uh, eight hundred thousand dollars for a number of our volunteer fire departments around the county and seventy five thousand dollars for eli whitney's rec center remember we talked about that yes, one brian indeed, yeah yes. so uh, we know the money is going to be put to good use 
and we are just glad to be able to do that for you. Amy and I love Alamance County. Our families have been born and raised here, and this is a great place to live and to raise a family and to work, and partially because of what you all do too on a daily basis. So thank you. We're subject to your approval. Oh, no. If you will allow us to come up and then allow the volunteer firemen to come up for separate photographs, would you allow us to do that? That would be terrific. If I could just add one thing about the volunteer fire departments, they hundred thousand dollars earmarked for our volunteer fire departments was just really important, I think, to both of us as rural residents. And recognizing that there was a lot of COVID relief money that came um, through the channels to uh, various local governments through the state. But uh, as all, so often happens, the volunteer fire departments got overlooked somewhat in all of that. And they have, it's been one of my um, joys to serving as a county commissioner and as a senator to get to know the people in the uh, the volunteer fire departments around the county and to be get a better understanding about the sacrifices that they make personally, that their families make, and um, I just really appreciate them and the hard work that they do and all that they contribute to um, to rural life to the county. And so I hope that as they, you know, figure out, gosh, how do we spend the the money that. Um, that they will just remember that uh, we appreciate them and it's a token of, of our recognition for the hard work that they do. Absolutely. And I would like to state as we're walking up, these guys have done a wonderful job for LMS County. I don't remember a time when we've received such input and representation and monies that these two representatives have given to us in LMS County. Uh, yeah, a little more to my left, your right. There you go. And uh, I can't see you. <laughs> uh, I, I think I've seen everybody's faces. Um, uh, yeah, there you go. That works. And let me let me take a few more from a slightly different angle. There we go. Well. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, we do have we do have representatives from uh, like our emergency service office. We have time for another picture. I think we have uh, emergency management, social communications. Uh, we also have EMS. Our sheriff's office, these are folks that will benefit from the uh, emergency facility. So, y'all can take one more. Get up there, sheriff. Put your foot in. Yeah, is this 
Do you have any reason I ran for the altar? Thank you all very much. Thomas is earlier was just practice for now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we hey, hey, we've seen his pictures. <laughs> he needs practice. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, there is action required with this uh, wonderful windfall for the citizens of Alamance County and all of these uh, emergency service and mental health folks, uh, as well as our facility down at Eli Whitney. There are two items in your packet that do require board action. One is a grant project ordinance that takes uh, these funds that have been secured by Senator Gailey and Representative Rydell and uh, budgets them. So that, that's a vote to approve the grant project ordinance that was included in your packet. And let's and then, take these one at a time. Okay, very well. Then you can, uh, you can see in your packet uh, the uh, funds are laid out, $15 million for the new um, Alamance County Emergency Service Facility, $800,000 for uh, vehicle and equipment for uh, volunteer fire departments, $500,000 for mental health crisis and diversion center capital, $75,000 for the Eli Whitney floor. We are also including two items that came from state government at this time also, which includes $40,000 for the Textile Heritage Museum capital and $84,269.66 for sheriff's office equipment. So that one vote of the grant project ordinance will budget, will receive these funds and budget them. I'll make a motion to approve that as uh, pursuant to the ordinance that is in our packet. I'll second and that. And adding the Glencoe to it as well. I'll second that. Any discussion? I'm just curious, what's equipment? What is the equipment? We're, uh, we're helping with emergency service uh, with the equipment on top of the emergency service trailer. It's satellite. Satellite. Uh, we also, uh, out of 84,000, we look at, uh, we can know we had a uh, man that was in the river this past weekend, gotcha. and we were down in the woods. We're, we're, we're looking at buying a four wheeler with a basket on it where we can haul bodies out of the oh. woods. And I will say, commissioners, that. Uh, well, that was a tragic event. Everything I heard about the coordination of emergency management, sheriff's office, fire, rescue, and state level uh, emergency services and uh, volunteer fire support around the county was excellent. Thank you, Sheriff and uh, emergency management both indicated that that event went very well. We used our new MC1 unit that I believe is going to be the recipient of this new satellite communication too. So. That was a friend of mine's husband, and um, that was a friend of mine's husband, and she talked about how great of a job you guys did. Absolutely, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you, commissioners. And the second part yeah, of the motion <laughs> is uh, to basically take uh, the eight hundred thousand dollars that is coming from state government use it in our budget to pay for $800,000 worth of equipment that the county has purchased and then free up county dollars for the volunteer fire departments to use to buy the uh, $800,000 worth of equipment they need. We're doing this with the approval of the Office of uh, Budget Management with the state because uh, the way the state budgeted, technically, it, the county would have to own the equipment uh, from the fire departments. We would not be able to sub-award that. The recommendation was use these state funds to pay for county purchases and then free up county dollars because the count my understanding from fire is they've obtained a lot of these quotes already uh, they're eager to move they don't want us to have to wait till possibly May to, to do something about the language of the budget so uh, this will be a budget amendment to use the 800,000 to pay for the county equipment free up the 800,000 in county dollars to be used for the fires equipment motion to approve second in discussion 
All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Again, unanimous. And Thank uh, you. commissioners, it was a pleasure to work with Senator Gailey and Representative Rydell uh, on this. And really, I know, I really appreciate the work they did to bring these funds here. So, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, next item is uh, 7 2. Is it here? Uh, 7.2, the Mental Health Crisis and Diversion Center, uh, the subcommittee uh, elected Ms. Huffines, uh, Huffman, excuse me, Robin Huffman. Um, Robin is um, very special. She, uh, and I mean that in a very, very positive way. Uh, she's one of our leaders on the state level um, and uh, was very, very active with this subcommittee. Again, announce your name and title, please. Sure. Um, my name is Robin Huffman. Um, I am a longtime resident of Alamance County, but I work in Raleigh as the executive director of the North Carolina Psychiatric Association. And good evening. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Oh, I don't need that. But um, Good evening to you all again. It's good to see you. Um, I'm here tonight in a different capacity than I was last month because this time I appear to you as the chair, the elected chair of the Mental Health Crisis and Diversion Center Steering Committee. And that's the committee that you directed um, at last, the February 11th Board of Commissioners meeting to develop a recommendation to present to you all this evening. The Diversion Center is made up of 11 voting members and we have met twice since February 11th. We've met on March 4th and again on March 15th. But prior to the official steering committee meetings, and as I alluded to in my comments to you all last month, um, a great deal of work has gone into consideration of and planning for a diversion center in Alamance County. There was a day-long community dialogue in September of 2016 where 70 plus um, community leaders, providers, judges, law enforcement officers, advocates uh, met together and identified a diversion center with access to assessment as a number one priority for our county. Then again in October of 2019, a smaller group of leaders um, spent two days in a sequential intercept mapping process where they analyzed gaps in our system as it related to the intersection of mental health and the Justice Center. And once again, the top priority was to create a diversion center. Since that time, and actually before this steering committee was created and started meeting, members of the Alamance Steps Up initiative and county leadership had looked at and analyzed a number of county-owned buildings and other properties for Jail Diversion Center. Timing and space concerns had slowed down these efforts, but, but not the discussions. And in fact, what wonderful timing tonight to have uh, Senator Gailey and Representative Rydell um, present a check that recognized the work um, that we've been doing with um, a half million dollars for a diversion center. Your charge to the Mental Health Crisis and Diversion Steering Committee, February 11th, was to bring a recommendation back to the Board of Commissioners tonight. And at our March 15th meeting, we agreed to the following. The committee proposes that Alamance County obtain real property that offers sufficient and custom designed space that meets North Carolina licensure requirements for the operation of an enhanced mental health diversion center program model as will be described by VIA. The facility should meet the following criteria. Services should be provided in one location to ensure that a multiple array of needed services can be accessed by those in need with fast, effective delivery. Property should be strategically located contiguous to Alamance Regional Medical Center to facilitate the ability to divert from the emergency room those patients who are only in need of mental health or substance abuse services. The site must be owned by Alamance County rather than a long-term lease arrangement. 
the site must be developed or developable within a 12 to 18 month timeline. The building design must meet North Carolina program licensure requirements. And the property should provide approximately 28,000 square feet of custom design space. And finally, the optimal design would separate child and family services from crisis care and diversion services. These are the recommendations of the steering committee. And I believe that many questions you may have um, will be answered in the following presentation on the clinical programming to be provided in the Diversion Center. And so, if I may, I'd like to introduce Donald Roos, the Vice President of Behavioral Health and IDD Network Operations at VIA Health, our county's LME MCO, which is supportive of this effort. can tell she's uh, definitely done a few of those in her time so uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you Robin for that uh, first of all I'd just like to thank uh, chairman and commissioners for um, choosing VIA as your LME MCO representative for your county uh, we don't take that lightly you had lots of opportunities to go different di different directions and who is going to manage behavioral health for your services when we first met with your team um, in Alamance County when the process was going on, we listened to a lot of individuals in your counties. What are the needs? What's working? What's not working across, across the county? Not only for county representatives, but for citizens themselves. And over and over again, the number one need expressed to us was the need to really create a centralized diversion hub in this county that really addressed the needs across the system. And so from that point, VIA has been working to try to figure out how we can make that work for your county. And so tonight, we want to present a little bit more information on some work that we've done, where we're at as a system, where we think the county needs to go in order to address all the needs that have been mentioned by the steering committee, as well as all of the other county representatives, stakeholders, providers, community reps that are not in the room tonight, but have really had some input into discussing the challenges that individuals are facing in our system. What we have for you, I'm gonna do my best to look at the presentation <laughs> and look at you guys too. Um, but when you look at our system that we have today, and I think it's important to look what we have today in order to know where we're going for tomorrow, right? You gotta look at your past in order to look at your future. What we have today is a very fragmented system that occurs um, across your county. You got providers strategically located, you got community representatives, you got nonprofit organizations that are fragmented all over your county that generally don't speak all that well with each other or work that closely with each other to, to help people across the system. That lack of coordination, whenever you don't have a smooth handoff from one organization to another, you create opportunities for individuals to fall through the cracks or not get connected to the next step. Every time you create another step in the process, you create another challenge for someone that's already struggling with a mental health condition, a substance abuse problem, an intellectual developmental disability to not get what they need. And so the goal of this conversation is figuring out how do you make the system work for real people that have needs and make it easier on them, their families, and their service system. We know through COVID, our systems, you don't have to be in mental health to know it. You can turn on your evening news when you go home. Is the mental health crisis, the substance abuse crisis, is getting worse and worse across our country and in our counties. Uh, the number one sales during COVID, we could pull them. ABC sales did really well in North Carolina um, over COVID. And, uh, and we're seeing the impact of that now. The number of individuals that are trying to access services across the system, um, the impact on their families significant across the system. A lot of those individuals do not have insurance, they don't have Medicaid, and they're the most deeply impacted. So we're seeing the need grow, and we're also seeing that impact across our system in our EDs. I think we've heard the sheriff speak up here around the impact to your jails when individuals commit 
low-end you know offenses in the community they end up in your jails they end up in the eds they get crowded there and then there's really no good handoffs to get them out get them integrated get them back on their feet into the community currently operate in a system that's very siloed all of those law enforcement emergency departments our behavioral health system they're operating in silos and they're all doing their thing and when you sit down with all of them they're all working really hard and they're all doing a really good job but it's all in their silos and in order to get the system to work you got to get people out of their silos and you got to start talking about integration the reason why North Carolina right now is going through its largest Medicaid reform not only in the history of North Carolina but one of the biggest reforms nationally in the United States what they're taking on North Carolina is bigger than any other states doing right now is because there's been lack of integration for individuals not only for mental health and substance abuse services but medical services and transportation services and pharmacy services for people to get their medication and leadership in North Carolina recognized if we're going to really support those individuals we got to break down those silos we have to push for greater integration so what we're talking about is a really a five-part intercept type model that really brings these components through the same front door emergency services stabilization so the emergency services looks at that initial part where someone's actually in a crisis emergency you're not thinking straight you don't know what to do you got to go somewhere right we've conditioned citizens across North Carolina and every county same thing when you're in that crisis where do you go you go to the ED that's what we were all taught when you're in crisis that's where you go so we got to transform that stabilization once they get there you have to have something to do with them you got to stabilize them right you can't just deal with the immediate crisis you got to get them stabilized so stabilizing individuals we need those uh, detention facilities not only dealing with the crisis and we've talked about this is that when somebody comes out of the jail you have to treat that like it's a crisis right jail reentry is just as important as diverting people initially from the jail right that individual coming out of jail still got a lot going on in their life lots of craziness oop, in their system and so that jail reentry is part of this process it's part of working with that detention center that we're diverting on the front end but also diverting on the back end like that's an emergency because we really need those individuals to be connected with support hospitalization making sure all of those coordinated pieces um, with cone um, Alamance Regional are coordinated with this crisis system because there's individuals sitting in the ED that don't need to be there some individuals sit there for days on end that don't need to be there that could actually be integrated back and supported if they had the right level of supports the impact on those lives is crazy to think that so many injuries can't get to the right supports you have to sit in the ED we wouldn't stand for that if you had a broken arm and you were sitting in the ED those people wouldn't stand for that if they stubbed their toe and they weren't sitting in the ED so we got to find a better way to support the hospitalization and then that community support services is that everything in the community like <coughs> lots of resources in Alamance County to support individuals but the coordinated effort bringing them to one place is a really critical place in making this an easier process so some project partners I put them up here I actually could have five slides on this when we get done right of all of the wonderful partners that we can bring to the table uh, for Alamance County but the county as a partner with via as a partner the hospital our community treatment providers they're all over you got like 20 different providers in the county not coordinated doing their own thing for individuals local community organizations you got great programs in this county that are working with individuals homeless individuals food pantries these are all wonderful organizations that right now are doing their own things really well but not in a coordinated effort law enforcement entities detention facilities and then lastly community support groups does anybody know where to go like if you want to go to an alcoholic anonymous group in your county or maybe a recovery support group or maybe a NAMI family to family group why is it so hard for somebody that's in recovery trying to find support in their community not know where to go to get that support across your county 
maybe it's at one church one weekend and it's Wednesdays at another church you got to look there's no you know you got to look in your local newspaper find out where they're at that needs to be a coordinated effort so people not only can get the treatment they need but when we're when they're done with their treatment they have that long-term support system that they can that they can go to and when they're they're having um, challenges which they come up we all go through our valleys right when we hit those valleys that supports there for them again right in order to help them in the recovery process so what we're proposing is a center that's 24 7 365 the doors don't close because the need doesn't stop right individuals have challenge all overnights they have challenges on holidays and so our center should be able to support that let me interrupt you there sure currently if that person is at our center and it's the clock strikes midnight what happens to them so individuals either have to transition back to home or they got to go or over to the ed or on the street right um that's sort of the option so we would be looking for a 24 7 365 um, operation so what we're proposing is a coordinated solution one location where anyone the individual can get their needs met within that location and everyone knows where to go uh, for the support of that so here's some services that we expect that we're um, asking you to think about supporting for this center in order to make it work for Alamance County emergency walk-in clinics very important when someone's in an emergency they're not going to do it on on our timetable when they're in an emergency they need help when they need it just like when someone's in substance abuse recovery when they want to get help you better be ready then because if you wait until tomorrow they may change their mind right that center's got to be there it's got to be available it's not only got to be open when somebody needs it but you got to have it staffed in a way that the person can get support when they need it and when the and this support can look very different could be somebody that's coming in for substance abuse recovery but maybe their number one need in their life at that particular time is they haven't eaten in a day and a half now do you want to talk to someone about their substance abuse recovery when they haven't eaten for in a day and a half not going to work right so if you're not coordinated with somebody a food pantry or something else to meet that number one need what's going to happen is you're going to talk with that person around their substance abuse crisis they're going to leave and they're not going to come back you got to be able to meet them where they're at where their needs are at within that center for the service uh, a 24 7 365 <coughs> behavioral health urgent care and why is that different than a walk-in center this is an urgent care facility that has emergency chairs in it where an individual can actually sit there and be there for up to 23 hours now during that assessment time you may determine hey this person needs to go to the hospital they need to be on an inpatient unit that's their level of care well they can actually sit in there and the unit can actually work to find a bed for them at a hospital in that in that setting versus go to the ed and sitting in the ed waiting for a bed somewhere the individual can go back home with some support mobile crisis maybe they're they're moved back home with the right support but it gives you ability not only to assess but to take that 23 hours to stabilize maybe you just need to get some meds started with them again maybe they've been off their meds for a couple of days and you get them back on their meds they stabilize and they can go back home gives you the flexibility to do that with that urgent care capacity within the system the other part is a facility-based crisis center that's your residential component to say hey this person actually is going to need a couple of days to stabilize to get on their meds or whatever so we got to have the ability to have some actual treatment beds in there so we'd be proposing uh, it's actually not six beds um, it should be 16 beds um, so typo there 16 bed um, facility-based crisis that has the ability for individuals to stay there usually from 7 to 14 days um, if they need it they don't really need to be you know in a psychiatric residential floor at a, a hospital maybe they need substance abuse detox maybe they're in a mental health crisis that can um, that can uh, be okay on a non-medical unit and they can be stabilized within there and then removed out back to the community with the right level of supports the center would also have an on-site pharmacy you might say well why is that important well the majority of crises on the mental health side when you really look at them 
can really be supported by making sure individuals get back on their meds that they were taking or to get quick access to meds. There's a lot of individuals that destabilize. They're actually seeing a provider. They get prescribed meds, but then when they leave the facility, they never go to the pharmacy to fill their meds. And then the next day you see them in jail, you see them in your ED because there was not a connection between it. So the system's promulgating some of these crises. So having an on-site pharmacy reduces your barrier. That you're actually taking the person right across the, the waiting room to the pharmacy where they can actually get meds that same day. They can be discharged with their meds. They don't have the barrier of going and finding another pharmacy to fill the scripts or even having a couple dollars in order to fill their medications uh, within the site. Up here, drop-in center is another component we're looking at for this facility. And you're like, well, what's that? Basically, that's, that's your center to run by peer supports, and those are people with lived experience. They've been there. They have mental health, and they have their own substance abuse conditions. They're in recovery, and they're there to support other people that are on their recovery journey. This peer living room allows individuals to walk into the center, and maybe they don't need to see a therapist or a doctor, but maybe they're really having a really rough day. Maybe they're going through that valley, and they just need somebody to give them a little support, a little direction. They can walk right into that peer living room model. There's a refrigerator in there, grab themselves a Coke, sit down with a, a, uh, another peer support specialist and say, hey, I'm struggling with this. You know, what would you do? And be like, well, this is what I did um, to help me get through that tough time. Just that level of human contact. I think we've all seen this through COVID, right? Is that that lack of human contact has driven up the anxiety in our community, the emotional support. So by giving someone with a mental health or substance abuse that tends to be more isolated than us, that ability to connect with another human being is very powerful. And it's really an important part of the recovery process. An open access outpatient clinic, again, when people need access to services, they need access to those particular services. So this center would have an open access model where people would come in, they get connected to the right services, same day, same supports, not just for emergency services, but routine services. If they need to be on a community support team, you may not know what that is, but it's a team of people that go into the community and actually work with people in their own houses, get them connected, make sure you're there. They can get connected uh, in that center. If they need a, uh, a support and employment team that's gonna take someone out and help them find a job, that team can connect them within the center. So having that open access to where, hey, I don't need to schedule an appointment three weeks out in order to go in there, get an assessment, do what I need, an important part. Um, getting close to the end, I'll try to talk quick uh, before Brian pulls me away real quick. Um, but recovery supports, again, I said that, is one day, if we got a 24-7, 365 facility, I think the recommendation was for 28,000 square feet, why have only 5,000 of it open in the afternoons, you know, in the evenings, right? Let's utilize the space. So let's offer that space to our AA community, our, Nar our Narcotics Anonymous community, our NAMI, our other recovery supports um, across the system. Our church is doing wonderful. Let's offer some state-of-the-art state space for them to do that work in our center that already has wonderful, beautiful rooms, has um, opportunities um, for them to come and integrate, and then the community knows, hey, this is where, if I, if I need to go get support on a eight o'clock on a Tuesday night, hey, they're having a recovery group at the, uh, at the diversion center. Let's go over there and connect with some people. So it's creating that one-stop part for that. And then lastly, uh, co-located community supports supports all over the place in your community. How do we get those integrated into facility? Reduce the handoffs, like I started talking about. If somebody needs access, they need to get on Medicaid. Why do we have to send them across town to sit in another line to wait for another person to get them access to Medicaid? Let's bring those supports to them so those Medicaid, people determine Medicaid eligibility, do it on site. Housing supports. You know, housing people in a community, can we bring them on site to actually take their application while they're there instead of making them go across town to fill out another application? Um, these are all of these things. Vocational rehab also does stuff. These are places we can integrate on site, 
give them you know office space within the center so they're co-located and coordinated to really address your most vulnerable population you know, these are the individuals again that are you know potentially suicidal homicidal you know that are really you know they're at risk for overdose in the community it's really impacting our EMS partners and our you know everyone that we celebrated here today of their wonderful work wouldn't it have been great if we would have been able to have something that prevented yes. them and the need for that work in there um, it's all great but this is an important piece um, of that puzzle um, so what we're talking about is just a coordinated one way with a single point of entry in the system and so the diversion center we really want you to consider is that one single point of entry where individuals can not only go in crisis but they also can be directed to in the system to where they're connected uh, to where they need to go um, so we're asking for a coordinated investment and if the county's willing to support bringing up this facility um, via has committed our leadership has committed that we would cover um, the startup expenses for this facility once the building is built it's going to have to be furnished there's going to have to be uh, beds put in there and these you know beds aren't expensive these are bed bug proof furniture all of the state of art there's going to be medical um, beds in the center there's labs there's pharmacy space um, so via is committed that we would work uh, with the providers whoever's chosen the operational of this facility to uh, make sure that it's um, we cover the startup costs for the furniture the things as well as 90 day startup for staffing and employees until that facility can be fully operational and begin billing for Medicaid other commercial payer sources um, over that period of time and so I come to the end um, but this is what we're talking about this is what we've heard from your community um, that you know you guys are looking for what's needed for the citizens of Alamance County and I'll close by saying we've done this work in other counties we've seen the impact this has um, in other counties rural as well as urban counties and it is significant the number of people lives you can impact by really making the system easier for them with an initial investment of this diversion center it's not an investment for today it's an investment for tomorrow and hopefully long past all of us are retired this center can continue to help people and get people back on the right trail mr reese you were on the subcommittee correct i was and uh, all the components that you've talked about right here tonight is in the recommendation of our subcommittee is that correct that is correct okay any other questions for me before i hand it over to our next speaker if not i'm going to hand it over to uh, mark gordon uh, the president of uh, alamance regional and vice president of Cone. and Sorry. vice president yeah. <laughs> thank you very much commissioners good evening Commissioner Paisley, um, it's my honor to be here again with you to uh, seek your partnership for the support of this diversion center. And the why of this, nice job on the outline of the coordination of care that's needed. I wanted to bring two faces before you, vital to our community. One is Greg Moyer, who runs our ED at Alamance Regional. The other face is Mac Whitsitt, the guy who runs behavioral health at Alamance Regional. So I'm going to offer them 45 seconds apiece just to tell you a little bit <laughs> about what it's like in their world. Good evening, folks. I'm Greg Moyer. I'm the director of Alamance Emergency Department. Uh, the ER is a chaotic place to be. Uh, we see anywhere between five and eight new behavioral patients daily. Uh, those, those patients may come and go that day, but they may stay over. Uh, that increases our census, the acuity of the, of, of the department. A lot of these people are, are volatile, meaning that they can be very aggressive at times. We've had staff hurt, uh, broken bones. We've had patients also get hurt. This is in the mix of trying to treat the medical patients of the emergency room too. So this project would be a very huge benefit to the county and to the uh, patients we serve in our hospital. Thank you. 
Good evening. My name is Mac Whitsitt. Um, I am the nursing director for the behavioral medicine unit. And that trickle-down effect from the ED comes to my unit. So patients who come in, they're violent, they come down to my unit. My staff has been assaulted as well. Um, a lot of the patients that I see are substance use patients, and this facility would divert them from taking a bed that would better fit somebody who has a psychotic <laughs> disorder or a thought disorder or some kind of uh, mood disorder. So. We like to see the patients who are able to process in groups, so we give them some type of um, tools to use to be able to go back into the community and live a productive life. So this community center would definitely be an assistance, uh, not only for the ED, but also for the behavioral medicine unit. Thank you. Thank you. So I was doing rounds on hospital uh, this past uh, Thursday, and I heard this commotion going on and it was a young nurse who was being attacked by a patient and the patient had not received involuntary commitment yet but was very volatile had both behavioral and medical needs but did not belong in a medical unit they to max point they were better placed in a different facility in Alamance County it's vital that we protect our people who are serving our community. We are in a very, very, very important time where those young nurses who are working are precious, precious resources for our community. The young lady was a bit shaken up by that encounter. And one of the things that we're experiencing both in Alamance County and we're seeing across the nation are nurses leaving the field of nursing because of violent incidents. We are here in immense support for our population in our community, but also for our clinical frontline caregivers to protect them so that they can serve our communities. This will be vitally important. Now this model is also of the Diversion Center is in Guilford County. We've learned quite a bit. We are here in support of the model for the Diversion Center in Alamance County we also would like to be at the table and continue to talk about how we serve the medical needs in addition to the behavioral health needs of our community. We are in the midst of opening up a gero psych department in the spring, late spring, at Alamance Regional for those populations of patients who are 55 plus, as defined as geriatric in this case. But we uh, have uh, some need also to, to serve adolescents and our kids different than our adults. So we're here to say we're in partnership to get this model initially off the ground, as well described by VIA, but also to stay at the table and to, and to evolve this model over time so that we begin to, get, begin to serve the unique needs of individual populations of patients. Happy to uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening and uh, look forward to your partnership. Yes, sir. If the subcommittees um resolution is in fact adopted by us uh, and it's uh, adjacent to Kane. could we have direct access or likely to have directly to your facility <coughs> so that they don't have to go out on a major highway or someone else to reach the hospital? Yes sir. Anything we can do that would make the efficient and easy use of our uh, resources so that we're working in partnership together and minimizing the burden on our scarce resources and staff uh, and make it easy for our patients to use, we're at the table to figure out a way to get that done. Thank you. Yes, sir. Was the Guilford County uh, Divergent Center funded? Do you, do you have any insight into that? It is funded by the county um, in part, and it's also as the billing process that VIA is putting into place with services. Glad to hear the 90-day proposal in, in order to get that revenue stream going. But it's also public, and, and quite honestly, uh, we're getting some private dollars uh, from individuals who have interest in seeing the, the, the behavioral public health uh, needs of our community served. Is the facility owned by the county, or is it? Yes, yes sir. Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to ask a hard question. It's okay. And I know you're brilliant and you'll get it. <laughs> okay. I don't have any doubts. Um, I listened to Mr. Moyer describe about uh, the dangerous people that come in the ED. 
and these same dangerous people are going to walk in this diversion center. So that danger is going to be wherever they walk in. So your staff will be sometimes have a dangerous right there, and then a diversion staff will have the danger because it's not the staff. It's what's walking in based on what they are going through in their life. Um, so wherever they walk in, there's a possibility of this danger. So why is your staff not, not, should not be privy to danger, whereas the diversion staff should be? Very good question. Just based on the situation. Yep, so the diversion staff would be specific to a behavioral patient having the, the knowledge and the education for it mm -hmm. as an ED nurse we are we have behavioral we have medical we have all that education behind us but to lead into and be specific for the behavioral population that group core group would have that intense training uh, how to de-escalate patients how to uh, help control that patient plus we'd have you know security staff there would be also we have security in the hospital uh, to say it's sufficient that's a conversation but uh, but as a diversion center they would have a higher level of uh, de-escalation education behind them okay and one obvious question that I've been called about and asked about from the citizens um, I know we have canodal center my dad's been a hospital has been a patient in ARMC and it, he's miraculous just the best care y'all took my gallbladder <laughs> so I, I, I love my hospital and everybody that works there um, and I'm asked this question and I'm just going to ask it if this is so important and you've got the women's cancer center on the back you've got an amazing cancer center you've got canodal clinic you've got everything right there right there why would you not want to build a diversion center to where you would have your immediate care all under one roof in case they have to go from the diversion center into a specific type of medical situation instead of having to drive across the parking lot? It's a good question. And I'm, uh, I'm asking because I've been asked. That's my job here is to ask questions. So I see the lens of the emergency department. You know, that is the front door to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Uh, any medical admission, any psychiatric admission, that is the front door. Uh, you know, to say that we can't handle that, it is just the diverse population that we see. We see anywhere from babies being born to people expiring. Uh, so to have a specific direction for a specific patient would benefit that core group of patients. Let me add to Greg's excellent response. And that is the VIA presentation did a very nice job of setting the tone that it is a 24-7, 365 place that you can walk into at any level of care. Gotcha. As opposed to a crisis-only center, if you walk in knowing you're not, you're getting into trouble, but you're not there yet, that it doesn't represent something that's intimidating. Once someone gets to the level that they're presenting to the ED, mm -hmm they're usually pretty much in crisis or heading to crisis very shortly thereafter. If there's something that's just a little removed, it makes it a little more accessible to the public that it's not exactly at the emergency department, which we would love to take the entire community model and de-escalate it to a place where we're getting into and con making contact earlier in their disease. Okay. I, mean, I was just asked the question, why is in our hospital building this adjacent with part of their site because you've got everything to cover everything we've got an amazing hospital mm -hmm. and I, I just wanted to ask that question because no. I've had several to ask me it's a question. fair question okay. fair question thank you for asking thank you for your time this evening thank you Mr. thank you so much <clears throat> and our sheriff Mr. Johnson I think you can answer some of Miss Thompson's questions sure about can. security uh, hospital honestly is for medical purposes that is totally different than mental purposes those people are sick but not the kind of sick that a hospital normally has coming into the emergency room that's why sometimes this our deputies have to sit there 24 hours waiting for someone 
that is trained in psychotic, uh, psychiatrist way that can understand the mental health uh, patients' problems. Uh, you know, one in five and one in uh, 25 <coughs> adults live with serious mental illness in this country. One in 25. Just think of how many that is here in Alamance County that has not been discovered or has been dealt with in the past. 50% of chronic mental illness starts before a kid's age 14. We just had a serious situation where I think it was a 14 year old tried to shoot his grandma through the door and he had had mental health issues from day one all the way through and had been pushed to the side. I've been in this business 51 years. Mental health issues has been the biggest problem for me to deal with as a law enforcement officer uh, and as a sheriff. My first call, and y'all have heard me say this, was a man with a gun, and I'll never forget it from the day I live. I see it night and day when I think about the mental health issues. I arrive, I get out of my car, guy's got a gun. I'm thinking, well, I'm gonna have to kill him or he's gonna kill me. Guess what he done? I said, put the gun down, sir. <clears throat> I found out he had been to Cherry Hospital 30 times, and what they do? Turn him loose, turn him loose, turn him loose. The state, why do you think the state got rid of the mental health uh, services in the state? They couldn't deal with it. That's why we at the local level have got to step up and, and do something. These people are hurting, hurting. And we talk about violence in the, the emergency room. These nurses aren't taught to deal with that. We have officers over there, uh, security officers and stuff that wind up fighting with them. And folks, there is an answer to it. And the answer is before you tonight, what to do. And I'm begging you as the sheriff and as a citizen of Alamance County, let's take this challenge on. Let's show that Alamance County can be uh, a shining star for the mental health issues, folks. I would love to put each one of you in a deputy's car on a 12-hour uh, shift and you just see how many mental patients that we run into out there. Talking about violence, I've had now I think it's 20 tension officers attacked and I run the biggest mental hospital <laughs> in this county. Now it was the Alamance County Detention Center. And a lot of these people if they were dealt with at the diverse center, I ain't talking about the murderers, the rapists, and the robbers. I'm talking about the lower class misdemeanors. Guess what? They can become viable citizens and work and make a living if we can do exactly what has been demonstrated here to y'all tonight. I beg you, hey, there's not probably a family in this county that hadn't been touched somewhat by the mental health issue. Look down, look down the path of it. And guess what? We're the only people that can do something about this problem. And I ask each and every one of you individually, please, let's take the step and make a difference for these people. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Lord, I'd like to make a motion, and I know we'll have discussion after the motion, a motion to proceed with the Diversion Center by putting out an RE, RFP or other such appropriate documents as determined by staff with the requirements discussed by the uh, Diversion Center Committee, that is uh, Ms. Huffine's committee specifically, and all of those requirements in the RFP. And I'd ask that that be done as quickly as possible and a short return on that RFP. Do I have a second? Second. Any other discussion? All in favor signify well, I, us. Uh, just a comment. Um, first of all, I think we need a deadline. Yes. A hard deadline. Oh, on the absolutely. Um, I would suggest 30 days or uh, when's our next? Is it possible to have less than 30 days? We have talked about uh, our, our generally we put RFPs out anywhere from two weeks to 30 days. I think uh, if the commissioner were, commissioners were interested in hearing uh, the results uh, at an upcoming but not too distant 
commissioner meeting. I think we had discussed the possibility of the April 18th commissioner meeting. Uh, have the RFPs back in county staff's hands by uh, April 15th at the latest. That would give staff the opportunity to review them and prepare them and work with the legal department to make sure we present them to the commissioners in the appropriate format uh, uh, before your meeting on the 18th. So Can that, I that, amend my motion to have that component added with the deadline? I'll second that. A uh, couple more comments, uh, and I like the motion with the deadline. Um, I believe this is a valuable project for the, the, what's been stated here today. But we, we do need to be mindful of costs. Um, and, and I see what we do tonight if we, if we vote for this RFP as the first of a three-phase process to reach a diversion center that's also that we can afford. Uh, and that is we, we get RFPs, we allow for competition, we allow for, for different, uh, whoever, whatever entities want to be able to bid can bid based on the criteria that's been established. Um, the next phase is selecting a, a bid based on uh, uh, what's economically feasible. That would be the second phase. And the third phase is a, as we build, if we choose to, what we, what we can afford, what we, what we determine we can afford, uh, we are, as we're building, we're having discussions about programming um, with, uh, is Mr. we have discussions about programming, and I understand from previous conversations that that the services that we've talked about tonight are um, affordable based upon the current spend that the county spends now on mental health. Is that accurate? Correct. That would be looking at your current MOE contribution right. plus other the provider's ability to build other funding sources such as VIA or other commercial plans. And that with that in mind, we have those conversations as we go along so that we know that we're, we're maintaining an affordability in what we're doing. Second that we also have as an alternative in this bid process uh, an opportunity to have some shell space so that we don't necessarily have to build 28,000 square feet improved but that as, as Mr. Gordon discussed that that the center could evolve over time I think it's important that we allow for some of that and at least have in the bidding process an alternative that some of that uh, space is shell space that we could then grow into over time at least an alter alternate and I think that's important that we and I think staff can do that. I don't think it has to be part of the motion. And I'd add, too, I think we, it's imperative on anybody that wants to bid on this process that they get the, de the details they need to do the bid properly because this space is not your generic office space. I mean, I've been told that even hinges are different in a building like this. Door handles are different because of the nature of the people they're dealing with. They need to know everything that needs to go into the cost process so that we don't get a bid that's low, but then turns out they can't do the job that we need to have done. We need to specify, as Mr. Gore is indicating, uh, basically what those requirements are. They have to meet the state and federal guidelines anyway, and that's going to determine. I have visited the Guilford County Center uh, with VIA and, and various folks in this room, um, and even the door knobs are not anything that you would recognize in a normal building. They have to be suicide proof, for lack of a better term. Uh, you can't put your hand in the hinges and, and crush your hand because they have to be engineered in such a way that prohibits most, of, most if not all of those types of occurrences. So we're not looking at a, um, a warehouse. We're looking at a very, very specialized facility. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, Craig, you mentioned about the shale. What can you? What are you talking about? Just that we don't improve all of the space. That there be, I don't know, say a number of five thousand, four thousand square feet that's wrapped, that's uh, studs, wall, you know, low-bearing walls. That we allow for growth, or at least the possibility that we have space that allows for growth over time. Okay, and where which, will which, you which, get which that money from when you decide that you can develop it? Future boards, future boards, we have to determine that. Future boards? Yeah. So I, I would, put that Ms. Thompson, I'd like to, <laughs> to chime in on, on your, your comment. Uh, Mr. Turner and I have had that, that discussion. We have the money today. I'm not sure we'll have it next year or five years from now and whatever. I'm almost of the opinion that we go ahead and do it 
and do it correctly now. Uh, I understand the concern and I understand the need, but at the same time, uh, construction is not going to go down in cost. It's going to go up in cost. The federal and state requirements are going to be much, much, much more um, restrictive in the future as opposed to less restrictive. Uh, and right now, thank goodness uh, that we have the money. We won't have this opportunity very many times. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, frankly, I think that's a conversation for a different time. I totally I, agree. I mean, I, what, I, what I have requested is that in the proposal that there is an alternate that includes what the cost would vary based upon using some shelf space. I don't think we have to make that call now. I think that's part of the conversation that we have about the programming that goes into it. Yeah. So I think it's just an alternate that would be wise for us to consider. And I'm very supportive of that comment. I, I totally agree. I think it's very similar to the situation with the, the new additions to the court, court building. I mean, we've been told when the court building was completed, it was already out of date. And I think what Mr. Turner is saying is we don't want this building size and capacity wise to be out of date but maybe we don't spend maybe what we get is going to take care of the need but there's space that can be expanded into as the need grows. Like Alameda County as we've said many times is going to grow. It's let me explain the right in Zoom land. He's talking about the J.B. Allen courthouse that was built years ago. Uh, is that that's, that's what you're correct. talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah thank you. Let me just go back to what I said before you tried to educate me on what I said. <laughs> Didn't um, mean to do that. That's okay. I'm used to it. Um, whenever Craig talks about we build this building and we have, like, sometimes people don't finish their attic in their house, but when they decide to finish that attic, it has to be paid for. And if you're not going to finish that right now with your ARP money, somebody's going to have to decide on how you're going to pay for that when you decide to finish it because if you're going to build it and never use it why are you going to build it and i, I don't and i i don't want to put that on another board that is on us right now so i don't want to lay away another two or three or four million dollars on another board that isn't even here and that's not against anything anybody's saying i'm just trying to understand how we can build a building and not finish it and then, because this money's going, we're chomping at the bit to spend it. And I understand that. But at the same time, it will have to be spent. Well, would we want to even build a building if we don't have it finished for future things? And that will have to be paid for. And if all of ARP is gone, that means the citizens pay for it. Of course, we all pay for it anyway. ARP money's tax money. There's no such thing as grant money's tax money. Everything's tax money. And um, I, I'm, I'm very supportive. For diversion, I, I, I waited in my car two hours this morning to take somebody to treatment, and they didn't show. That's just how they do. That's part of this wicked business of addiction, and um, and I work in it, so I I might understand what we're talking about here. And I mean, I'm not trying to be a broom rider. I'm just trying for us to think about the later, because it's like telling a teenager they don't think there's a later there is a later and it's very important it'll be on you before you know it so I'm, I'm just curious about this building this and not finishing it and then finish it later because we're responsible for later that's what we do right now so you can go ahead and vote and whatever well, you want if you, to if you look at the at the J.B. Allen court space I'm not talking about the J.B. Allen court you're space because you're going to have crime it's like a run to sell <laughs> just use that I'm just using that as an example yeah had we added another floor unfinished to that building at the time we didn't think we needed it didn't know when we might need it but had we added that floor then as a shell now it would be a whole lot cheaper for us to finish that space out and make modifications to the other space since that framework was already in place Rather, I'm not saying not to finish what we need today. What I'm saying is, and I think Mr. Turner's saying, is get what we need today, but have it built such that we have the ability to expand into it in the future, and then the cost won't be adding another entire building at one end of it because you can't build it so you can't go up another level or something of that nature. But there's still a cost, right? And, and that'll have to be paid by somebody. And I'm, I'm just, I'm just, you know, people call me like they call y'all, 
And my job as this position is to relay those questions, just like I spoke with Mr. Sure. Ford. I, I, you know, those kind of not real popular questions we have to ask sometimes, but I need that answer because he's not speaking to me, he's speaking to all of Alamance County. And, um, well, and I, that, excuse me. Go, go ahead, ahead Jafon. In, in my example, you wouldn't spend the money today to build something you needed in 15 years or 10 years. But when you get to 10 years out, if you've got a shell, that you can finish versus having to go ground up with a brand new building, then you've got the ability to save that much money. We but would spend you more gotta money have, have money. That's, That's right. what I'm saying. Not much or later, whatever. Just like the massive new high school we're spending and doing that because you will outgrow it in a matter of no time because our county is, is a great place to come and live. We've got a lot to add to that. Right. And we don't want to start out small and have to add on when it comes to something like that. We've seen double wides we've seen extra buildings added on and it really takes away from the look of a school where there's no consistency and i'm that's all that's all i'm saying bill do you have anything are you done well the only thing i was going to uh maybe clarify what i think what craig's thinking and correct me if i'm wrong i think what you're thinking maybe is like uh you put a uh just just example you put a twenty thousand square foot building on this side and my, you're in the process of building it, maybe you put a 5,000 square foot building over here. But that 5,000 square foot building is just a shell. It's just curb and, gut, so uh, curb and gutter and it's just a shell. Nothing ever goes in it. And then that building may sit there for four or five years before you, you might need it. And then when you do need it, that's when you would, like Ms. Thompson saying, you, that's when you would have to come to the taxpayers and say, because you couldn't have COVID money after that. COVID money runs out December 31st, 24. So, what so I understand what you're saying, and I think it's it's viable, and I do think it's possible that you could do that scenario with the money that you have now, have that shell over here. You would be able to expand into it at some point, but Steve is right as well that you would it would cost you less money to expand that five thousand versus the twenty grand that you started with. I can see that, I can see that, but I I really am um, I really like the way that we are proceeding. Uh, going forward, I, I really like that, that we are or making sure that we're dotting our I's, crossing our T's, and making this the most cost-effective way we possibly can. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the Alamance County taxpayer is going to own this facility. And we don't want them to have, uh, w we just don't want to put them in a situation in which these costs start to expand faster than we can pay for them. Uh, and I would hate to, uh, I would really hate to get into this and then the cost gets so incredibly crazy that we got to drop it, you know? And it's just like, man, you know, we built all this, built, took all this money to build these buildings, but hey, we don't know that. I mean, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, but I would really hate for that to happen. That's why I'm really trying, I'm really glad that we're being methodical about this and, and, and going through the process the way we should. I think it's the, the best way to go. May I call the question? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Staff, your task is in front of you. <laughs> and it's short lived. Hey, yes. Brian, you got to knock this out. You got to have to hang out for until April 18th. Well, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, sorry. That's why we got to do it. I, I will say, commissioners, uh, we'll begin on this tomorrow. I think. Uh, uh, the county management working with for county legal as well as our purchasing department uh, but also would include uh, the folks in budget that have been specializing in art compliance and I could also foresee uh, Ashley Motley who is with um, the health department but has been working with us very closely on our mental health uh, program coordination and I do think working closely with VIA as we prepare the uh, RFP we want to stay close to them to help us make sure we get good parameters out and we also would want to stay in contact with Cone, too. I think that would be important. So we will begin tomorrow putting this together as quickly as we can, but as efficiently and appropriately as we can, and get it out the door ASAP with a goal of having results back uh, in hand by April 15th. So thank you. Thank you. Alcovets, we put you all your mail on. <laughs> uh, I talked to the... Uh, County Management, Mr. Haygood, I've talked to uh, Mr. Bechtel, our uh, County Attorney, and they all say the concern, uh, the question was, 
Uh, Alco Vets is a nonprofit. They're doing a lot of really top-notch work for all the veterans in the entire county, and we appreciate it. Uh, our legal staff has indicated that it is proper for us to give to a nonprofit. Uh, and additionally, Ms. Taggart has verified through, um, I think, our uh, clerk as well, that we have made uh, gifts on rare occasions to nonprofits. Uh, I'd make a motion that we give this 1973. Uh, 2003. Uh, excuse 2003. me, 2000, what I say? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it's a classic, I want to buy it. <laughs> That's a classic, guys. <laughs> this antique <laughs> 2003 uh, vehicle to Alcobats. Do I have a second? I'll second it. I, I, I do have a co question to ask. I've talked with the sheriff about the vehicle, and it's uh, what? How many miles are on that? It's, I don't know the exact miles right now. It's a high, it's high miles on it, but uh, you know, uh, we if we put it on Gov deal, I don't think we won't get two or three hundred dollars out of it. We have never, when we started putting our vehicles on Gov deal, we wasn't getting nothing for them. Right. We were getting, so we started giving our cars to ACC to work in the BLET program. And this vehicle, you know, uh, even we probably could get uh, the college to do any mechanical work on this vehicle. Right now, it runs, runs good. But Well, that was my next question. I mean, if, it, if it's high mileage and relatively old, my concern was that uh, we're going to have volunteers driving what I consider to be our precious veterans back and forth to Durham in a vehicle that may not be as dependable as what they've been driving in the past. Um, and so I wanted to, to make this sure that there was a chance. This vehicle is dependent, but you know, we're running up and down the road, sometimes uh, uh, high speeds if something breaks bad in the vehicle, transport stuff. Uh, and I'm, I'll be honest with you, I think we ought to look after our veterans. We're able to sit here tonight in peace because of what they've done for us in the past. And uh, these are veterans with medical problems trying to get to a hospital for treatment back and forth. And as one reason I, uh, you know, I said we would, if the commissioner decided we would be willing to give this vehicle to you. I assure you, I will talk with Alamance Community College if there's any problems with it and see if we can get it corrected. I can, uh, I can confirm what Mr. Sheriff told, the Sheriff told you. I took the number and just called a friend who's in the business said, how much would you give me for this car with 200,000 miles on it? He said, you want me to come get it or you want to pay me to come get it? <laughs> he said it'd be worth about $300, yeah. three, 350 tops. Okay. So um, um, I, I'll make a solution, I'll, I'll give you a solution. Um, Normally, I would be apprehensive to, to do this. But I bet if, you're going to say the same thing I was thinking about. I, I was thinking about, you know, I, if it's if we can cons we can say it's worth 350 or 500 bucks, whatever it is. If it's a big deal about the county giving this to, I'll be more than happy to give the county whatever they want for the car, and they can then they don't have to worry about right. They don't have to worry about what the problem is. I'll be more than happy to take care of that. I just don't think that's necessary. Yeah. I think the county can afford oh, sure. to do this. But if it's an issue, like if it's a nonprofit kind of thing, and, but I think that you're right. I think it was 2007 uh, we gave a uh, an ambulance to the Red, Cars, Red, Red Cross to use in emergencies. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, Didn't I we think... Did we uh, at one time, too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, so the, uh, the, the, last, the last time we could find that the county had... Uh, Donated property to nonprofit was 2007 of Red Cross. Uh, the board voted to give the Red Cross an ambulance to use in emergencies on a local basis. Mm -hmm. That was the last uh, issue we could find. In fact, that was the only thing I think we could find at all. 15 years. Searching the minutes of 15 years ago. So it's there's really there's nothing like that out there. Yeah, it's rare. Full disclosure, Mr. Chairman, I am a member of Alco Vets. I have no financial interest in this transaction, and I intend to vote for it. Anybody else? This a member? Are you a member? No, I'm not a veteran. I thought you were on the board. Yeah, I'm not. Well, 
I'm just glad to hear how much we support veterans. I really am about their transportation because I know the Veterans Services Office always have um, sometimes homeless veterans that are needing places to stay temporarily and transportation. And I'm glad AlcoVets is there to provide that um, service. And I'm glad that we're willing to provide services like that for the veteran that needs a ride to the hospital. And I hope my fellow commissioners will be willing to consider actual housing for homeless vets that are living in the woods or underneath the bridge when we have a possibility of doing something for them as well. Because a veteran is a veteran and we owe them everything. So um, I just hope you'll think about that when we are looking at different things in the future. Yeah, let me clarify that. Um, I have worked closely with Alco Vets and I have given them free legal advice and will continue to do that. I just thought you told me you went to their meetings. I have been to some of their, I've been to many of their meetings. Yeah. That's just what I asked you. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it doesn't matter because what they do is important regardless of who comes to their meetings. Call the question. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. We have uh, been asked to have a 10 minute break. <laughs> you did not. <laughs> Two minutes. Minutes. Thank you. Uh, you're not next. Oh, I'm not next? You're not. <laughs> okay. You're not. Okay. Surprise, sure? surprise, Bruce. I thought he was next. I thought he was next. No. I'm recognizing Mr. Turner. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, tonight's meeting is an important meeting for a number of reasons. Two of those reasons are not readily apparent in your agenda. Uh, tonight, we are both paying tribute to the past and we're looking to the future. Um, many of you know that Brian Haygood will be retiring at the end of March, and this is his last meeting. And we thought it important to recognize that and to recognize him. Um, Brian was born in Alamance County Hospital, which is now the DSS building. Uh, he's been in Alamance County government for 27 years. I have uh, had the pleasure of knowing him only for one of those, but it seems like much longer. Um, he is, uh, he bleeds Alamance County. He has a passion for Alamance County. We have had numerous, and I know all of us have had numerous long conversations with him about the competing needs of the county, about the challenges of the county, but also about the potential of the county. And he is so passionate about Alamance County, about its citizens, about staff, about its institutions, and about just the land. Um, he's, he's got a farmer's heart. Uh, and he's, he's going to be leaving us and heading to uh, around Asheville. Uh, where the air might be a little finer at altitude, but I guarantee you he's going to tell you it's not as sweet. <laughs> um, and so, in, in coming up with how to best honor Brian, yeah, some of us thought that, you know, there's, a, uh, there's an award that's given at the state level that is for um, dedication and service and outstanding uncommon devotion to the state, and that's the Order of the Longleaf Pine, but there's no corresponding award at the county level that recognizes such achievement yet. Um, <laughs> and we thought it might be a good idea that if we had um, a similar award, uh, we might create that tonight and, and call it the Cone of the Longleaf Award. <laughs> and if there are seedlings that, that, that result in longleaf pines generated in every county, then we'd have a whole bunch of longleaf pines at the state level. So, uh, I have a resolution I'd like to read and I think there'll be a vote and then if Mr. Haygood will join me at the podium. Uh, I'd like to propose the, re this, the following resolution. A resolution establishing the Cone of the Longleaf Award, whereas the Cone of the Longleaf Award is hereby established to recognize individuals who have made contributions for the betterment of Alamance County. And whereas the county wants to recognize individuals for their commitment to Alamance County, and whereas individuals should take pride in all of their accomplishments and be recognized for their contributions, now therefore be it resolved the Alamance County Board of Commissioners approves and adopts the Cone of the Longleaf Award dated March 21st, 2022. I move that we establish such award. Second. Third. <laughs> Fourth. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Hate to see him go. 
Uh, hey, call the question. All in favor of, of said motion, signify by saying aye. 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 It is unanimous. And now that the award has been established, we think it proper and fitting that the first recipient of the Cone of the Longleaf Pine Award for Alamance County be Brian Haggard. Will you join me at the podium? All right. The, the award reads, in recognition of individuals who have displayed exemplary service to Alamance County, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners established the Cone of the Longleaf Award on March 21, 2022. This award recognizes individuals who have made significant contributions for the betterment of Alamance County. In recognition of exemplary public service to the citizens of Alamance County, commitment to the betterment of Alamance County, and leadership of Alamance County government, the inaugural recipient of the Cone of the Longleaf Award is awarded to Brian Haygood. May 18th, 1998, to April 30th, 2022. Thank you. Thank you. One other thing, it's normally fitting in situations like these that the recipient receives a plaque, and Brian certainly will receive that at his uh, retirement uh, ceremony next week, but it's very important that the etching on that plaque is done correctly and with the finest of instruments, and that takes a while. So in lieu of that, we thought it important that Brian have some token <laughs> so we're giving Brian a canvas bag full of pine cones but not any canvas bag and not any pine cones the a Alamance County commemorative uh, canvas bag <laughs> and and pine cones they're like any good legend there are two stories about where these pine cones came from one is that they were they were they were they were obtained from the first longleaf pines ever grown in North Carolina from southern pines. That's one story. The second one is that uh, Brian Baker and his dog Scout got them in a very ten minute, a uh, very quick <laughs> ten minute search at his house, and that they are the most symmetric and luminescent <laughs> pine cones that he could find. One of those stories is true. One of those stories is true. <laughs> so. Here's a bag of pine cones <laughs> and a plaque to follow. Brian, congratulations. Thank you. All right. Mr. Hagen, if you would allow us, we'd like to have a picture with you. Certainly. Yeah. Well, let me just say, commissioners, uh, I, I take that as quite an honor. Uh, I prefer this to the Order of the Long Leaf. Uh, this is. Absolutely, genuinely, Alamance <laughs> County, and I appreciate that. <laughs> and it, uh, it reminds me of one of my favorite movies, Mr. Roberts. Yeah, uh, that's where right. He, where he pins his, uh, his medal on. That, that means a great deal to me. It does indeed. It is uh, heart, heartfelt and pure Alamance County. I appreciate <laughs> that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. One more. Hold on, Thomas here. All right. I assume, I assume this will be. Uh, Get one on the other side, too, bro. John, I don't know what all this commotion about. He's being placed under arrest. <laughs> <laughs> so at least he'll have something to eat chew on. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's been an honor and just a privilege, and I can't thank the board enough for the opportunity to serve as county manager. And I, I thank the citizens also, because um, every time I come to the podium and I look at you, I see 170 thousand plus folks in my in my mind. So it's been. Uh, it's been a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you. You've done a wonderful job, Brian. We truly appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a privilege. Madam Clerk, this is an annual event, <laughs> and as established by Mr. Turner and his, as his motion, uh, it will be done on an annual basis to a deserving citizen. Put Brian Baker in as collector. 
election manager. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got a supplies way on the phone. Yes, sir. <laughs> so I am. So here we go. Um, so we've been talking about uh, opportunities for the county to expand broadband. Our, one of the pillars of ARP was to expand broadband. Um, and so uh, these opportunities have just come up. April 4th is a deadline for this year. So I'm going to go over just a review of the great grants, what we've done up to this point, and just tell you the opportunities. I have um, Derek Kelly from North State on Zoom. Justin Delancey from Charter Spectrum on Zoom. Michael Walker and Chuck Green from AT&T are here. Um, Jesse Day from PTRC who helps us the last few years on this pro on trying to get great grants. Mimi Clemens has been an important part. She's on Zoom as well. And Andrea has helped out a lot with this too. Okay. So the federal great grant program was introduced in the previous in, uh, administration in 2019 to help bring high-speed internet to families, businesses, and farms in the most rural, remote, and underserved areas of the county, country. The Great Grant Program was designed to help pay the majority of costs of new broadband infrastructure because farms are far between, and it costs a lot of money for the, the pipe. We've talked about pipes and the wires and the fiber and stuff like that. So they get left behind uh, with the uh, internet access. Um, this past year, $350 million was put into the Great Grant Program, which was a huge increase compared to what's been in there in the past, and uh, that's just for North Carolina. So there's a lot of opportunity out there to take a huge step forward. Internet service providers are the Great Grant applicants in this process, whereas Alamance County is considered a partner in the application process. Applicants must have a county partner with a county match to apply for Great Grant. Um, great grant funding is awarded by the NCDIT. If awarded, Alamance County will have committed matching funds with an ISP partnership letter of support. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. County financial match is determined by the scoring matrix from the North Carolina NCDIT. One of your things in there is the whole 81 page process of how they mm -hmm. uh, score okay. and calculate this. Other states, it's more arbitrary. I'm encourage that they have the scoring matrix because it, it helps out with the process and makes it fair. There's substantial savings to the county if ARP funds is used versus general funds. Financial guidance has been slow to come, just like with a lot of this ARP stuff, and April 4th is a deadline coming up, uh, so we know this time is of the essence for this year. Apologize for that, but we've been asking, we've been going to a lot of Zoom meetings, Mimi and I and Andre and those kinds of things, and uh, this all came in at the last minute. Uh, some folks out in uh, Zoom land, as you say, this is, you know, to help put in infrastructures, folks will still have to pay for their internet service. There are programs out there for low income to help pay for that as well. Um, we partnered with somebody in 2020 for a great grant, um, but it was not awarded. Um, it was a small section with about 65 homes, and we were willing to commit 150000 for that. But again, now there's been so much more money. At that time, it's 15 million total for the whole state. Now there's 350 million. A little bit of broadband history. Uh, expanding broadband in Alamance County has been a challenge well before the pandemic. Pandemic raised its awareness, but you know, in the school system, kids have to do submit their homework online. They have to check their grades online. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of choices there. You know, folks now are doing telehealth. Um, excuse me, I lost where I was. Uh, there's been many, many uh, calls and phone calls and, and folks contacting you and you sent them to me to talk to them about expanding internet access uh, and public comments. Uh, we've been working with the, the municipalities and different community organizations on the digital inclusion plan. Craig was part of that process a few times. And they focused on two different things, access, which is affordability, and availability, which is what we're talking about, which is infrastructure, because there's a lot of folks out there, they have the money to do it, they just don't have access, okay? So plan support students access, telehealth visits, there's been more and more of those during the pandemic, work from home, businesses and farms. We talked a few meetings before about, there was a couple counties that jumped forward and actually spent their ARP funds on broadband expansion and I said hey 
there's more money coming down the pike for us to use. So let's hold off. Um, Rockingham County did it. They don't regret it, but they're not allowed to go after this $350 million because they did it on their own. And there's additional uh, $400 million that's coming down the pike as well to help out this fall and next year. It's called a CAB project, which they have not finalized guidance on that, but the great grant is, is around right now. So the North Carolina, D, uh, North Carolina DIT will review, check, and score the ISP's proposals for all the counties and award the highest scoring ISP proposals great grant funding. A single grant award shall not exceed $4 million. No combination of grant awards <coughs> involving a single county may exceed $8 million in a fiscal year. If NCDIT determines that two applicants serve the same areas, then the highest scoring applicant wins gets that funding. Grant award notification is expected, you know, May to June of this year. <coughs> That's a little bit of background. We've got three uh, proposals that I'm going to show you briefly today. If you have questions, we have folks that can talk more to that. Only certain areas, because this, this great grant depends on census information and census blocks, we've talked in the past about we I can identify, we've done surveys and things that, this great grant just focuses on the census information. The next round of CAB will allow us to kind of put <coughs> certain areas too. But these areas we've checked also are in need. Extensive application process, uh, or we were talking about that. County financial match will not exceed the amount in the letter of support if we do that today. So if they go and get checked or whatever, then if anything, it can go down in price. Letter of support is a contract. I talked to Deborah a number of times about this, and we talked about, you know, even though it's a letter of support and we're not the applicant, it's still a contract if we agree to do this. Again, the potential to serve up to 2,500 households in great defined areas. Again, I'll show you the map. They have to connect those areas, and all those areas that are connected also will have the benefit of Internet access. But, you know, they can branch off into those things. So according to the federal maps, the areas in orange in the northern part and in the southwest all the way through the bottom are the ones that are eligible for this grant. And we've, we've had supporting information along those lines too. I'm going to go over the three proposals right now. So we've got AT&T, uh, Michael Walker. We've, uh, we've talked a number of times with him. and. They obviously, they're a, a partner in the a county. Some of you have AT&T. Matter of fact, Amy Gailey told me she finally got, she was actually in that area. She finally got a little bit from AT&T. Um, so they're proposing um, in the northern part, in that section, uh, a project that's uh, $2.3 million where the county's contribution would be $211,204. Okay. If we used, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, but if we use, that, that's the discount the county gets if we use ARP funding. If we use general fund, it would go up to $422,000. Can you repeat that again, Bruce? Uh, uh, so can you start uh, with, can you start at 2.3 and then break it down? Okay. So, and we've got folks that uh, talk about it. So, serving 1,377 folks, uh, the great grant program is $2,333,644. Uh, Alamance County's contribution or match would be 211,204. ADT would also be 211,204. So, for a total of 2.8 million, uh, $218,051. If we used general funds for that, then the state's contribution is less because of the formula. So the state, it's 1.9 million. Allen's County puts in 422,408. ATT contribution is the same, 422,408 for the same buildable area, same costs. So the state takes on less with the great grant funding if you use that. So Charter has also proposed something. There, and again, a lot of this information is proprietary. Um, 
they're private companies. They don't want to share where they're going and where they are and that kind of thing. That's been always been an issue in the past. So these areas in orange uh, collaborate with uh, the areas I showed you earlier. This is what they propose. 440 previously unserved passings or household and business that are in, they're in those areas for 3.6 million, 70 miles of fiber. That's something they disclosed. Uh, the county would, in either case, spend $20,000 in ARPA funds. That's it? That's it. So this is what cool. their proposal is. I asked them twice about it, and we do have somebody you can ask more questions on it. Okay. So there also is no difference between ARP and general funds in their proposal. Now again, well, I'll go over this in a second. North State Fiber. They've just uh, recently come to the county. There was a big announcement in February about them coming to the county. They're filling all these areas, which are pretty typical, the urbanized areas where it's lower cost to put in infrastructure. They propose, and you can't see it great, um, but north of Mevin, a section, and then a long corridor along there, again, connecting all those similar areas for um, that, the, that the federal government said we, we could use. So, and again, if you go back, go back to the other original map that I had. Is that road across the bottom, Greensboro Chapel Hill, or? It's lower than that. Lower than that. Oh, wow. Go back all the way to the, the two maps that Marlena did. <coughs> Which one? Keep going back. Keep going back. So again, connecting those sections in orange on the right-hand side is the southern part of the county, connecting all those areas. So they get funding to connect those areas, but they also have to, you know, it's not, it's like putting in a road, you gotta connect those areas. All those people along there also gets the benefit of it where they can get, you know, better internet. Fiber is, all these are fiber proposals rather than DSL and that kind of thing. So. So, to get down to the brass tacks. So, if you, if we write a letter of recommendation for any of the, all three of these projects, the total will be five hundred thirty-one thousand and two two hundred four dollars for an eight million grant grant investment in broadband expansion in Alamance County. That's a big jump. You're, you're leveraging ARP funds and getting eight million dollars out of it. If general funds are used, it's one point two million uh, for the same projects. So the difference is seven hundred five six fifty if you use ARP funds. Now, this is important to note, all three of those projects are over $8 million, okay? The limit is $8 million for up to, you know, multiple projects per year. I talked about that earlier. So, what happens is the state comes in and does their evaluation. They may find the math is wrong. They may, you because know, they're the applicants. If anything, it could go down in price, or they could choose one, or two and go on from there. So most likely what we commit, now we have to commit it, that 531 would probably go down. But because we're only writing a letter of support and that only enables them to do the grant proposal, that's where we're limited. And I understand this limitation because it's our, you know, our funds, taxpayer money. So Future broadband opportunities, non-funded projects that don't get accepted could reapply for CAP projects. Again, the guidance have not been finalized on that. But what we've been told, it's another $400 million, what we've been told is that we have a lot more say in that and that we don't have to use federal maps. We, we can use the surveys that we've been using the last couple of years and that kind of thing to kind of say, hey, we kind of, we know our county, we know our citizens, we can do, you know, some of these other areas. But in general, what you saw is what we've seen. There's just more areas that are underserved. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this takes a huge step forward. It's just an opportunity. But I understand ARP funds are very limited. Um, the program is designed <coughs> for us. You know, they want you to use ARP funds for this. Obviously, you get a huge discount if you use that. But you can use general funds. And there's other opportunities down the road. But this is. Like I said, it went from 15 million before 
with the great grant to 350 this year. So all last minute, mm -hmm. all last minute <coughs> guidance. I spent all weekend on this project just to kind of get it all together. Those guys as well, the folks that are on the phones, they were all getting the guidance at last minute and they submitted what they've done. The folks that do this, they do this for all the counties. Okay, and not all the counties are applying for this. There's talk of maybe down the road that you have one or two passes and that they'll open up more money, you know, for other projects. We will see. There's a lot of... We've well, had, you know, the return on this is 16 to 1. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's really, really good. So I was going to ask you, which out of the three proposals, which one do you like best? You know, we, we worked with all three of them, and I, I think if they both, if they're all being true, they cover different areas of the county. I think what you do is they only give us a few things to look at. What I've given you in your binder is the process. They have to dot, you know, all the I's and cross all the T's when they apply to the state. Um, we don't get to see all that. Now the, the city, the state has a bunch of stuff they have to comply with. If they don't, they get their money back. We get our money back, that kind of thing. But they've been through this before. I think they have different styles in the way they've handled this. I think the fact that we've gone from 15 to 350 brought out the big boys, okay? But it also is, at the end of the day, an opportunity to really spread out that um, the internet highway to the folks that have been calling you guys and asking about it. So, and like you said, there's a real incentive to use the art funds 16 to one, but I understand there's a lot of competition for that art funds, you know? Mm -hmm. So I told, this is just an opportunity so what I'm asking you tonight, and I talked to Deborah about this, is to consider voting to approve the creation of one or more ISP partnerships, letter of support, with funding commitment, the funding source, meaning ARP or general funds, and time for the April 4th deadline. Each letter will have a financial cap, which is what they have said it can't go over. Um, and of course, it could go down, it can't go up based on when they go through the process with the state. Um, assign, according to Deborah, you, because it's before April, assign a, a county agent to draft final partnership letter of support with a review from the county attorney and the North County uh, DIT to make sure it's correct. And um, all these are contingent on if they get accepted. So the letter of support they have to win. They have to get awarded for the, the, uh, the great grant. How confident are you that we can make that happen? Of the letters? Yes, sir. Uh, I've got templates. Um, the only reason you didn't see that in your package, we were literally getting stuff Thursday, Friday, over the weekend. Uh, in every county, matter of fact, uh, the gentleman from Charter is on three other commissioner <laughs> meetings tonight. He may be in and out. Um, they are here to answer your questions. What you see is pretty much their proposal. Now we've talked to at and for a number of uh, visits. We've talked to a few other folks. When North State came in, they were coming in guns blazing, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, competition is good. Um, the impetus is on the state to make sure they're doing it correct. And, you know, we're a small partner. Now, three hundred. Five hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money. That's a big, big chunk, but it gets to be leveraged. So yes, big time. So that's where we're at. And so what I need from you guys is if you want us to pursue that, you know, we can assign an agent. We'll get the letters of support, um, one or or all three or none. You can do any of those uh, examples. But um, we move forward. We'd find out. I'll give you another report on the 18th uh, when we get closer to May we find out who won it. Again, the last time we did this, we did all this paperwork and the state didn't award it. Uh, um, Bruce, I know during COVID with remote, with the school <coughs> system, we spent a fortune on hot spots. Yes. I oh, mean, dear. it was yeah. an absolute nightmare. It, yep. COVID showed us everything that we've been kind of doing wrong. Yeah. And I'm just curious um, if you've had conversations with the school system and also would this help alleviate that issue? Because this isn't broadband free to whoever wants it. This is just the availability for you to come on. It's availability. It. That's the access portion. Like if, if folks, there was a, I, I talked to the school a lot because I, the schools would send people to me to try to help them get internet. Yeah. And we had some stuff online to show people and we had some, but I mean, if the bottom line is you can't hit a tower, mm -hmm. 
and you can't get the Wi-Fi's, you can't do your homework. So those kids were, the next thing we were doing is like, what places are open for kids to go? They can go to McDonald's, they can go to a coffee shop. The county itself made a public Wi-Fi in all their buildings so that they could come in and do their homework. Um, obviously that puts kids at a disadvantage if they gotta go somewhere to do their homework and access their, their stuff. Well, if they couldn't be in school because it wasn't safe, why were they able to go somewhere else and do their homework right. with that availability? And that's all of a sudden safe. Okay. Situational COVID. So, like the booth at Blue Ribbon. Right. Okay, just curious. That's good news. So again, if you have questions about individual projects, we've got representatives from each project here. You can ask them any question you want. I'll answer any question. Obviously, you've got plenty of questions. You're asking them now. Am I correct you're asking us for a decision tonight? I'm asking for a decision tonight because of the April 4 deadline. Well, we've been hearing about this since before I came on this board. Mm -hmm. And I've heard a lot about this while I've been on the board. I know Pam has heard a ton about it while she was on the school board, especially in the last two years, and she was there about a year of that. Am I correct, Pam? Yes, I, I'm not over it. <laughs> oh, sure. So um, it was really, it was the high stress thing for parents, absolutely panic <clears throat> because their kids could not get hooked up and you don't want your kid going to sit in the parking lot somewhere trying to do their homework mm -hmm. with all the distractions going around. It was just a total cluster. It really was. Nobody's fault, just what it was. I mean, the, the return on the investment, as Bill just noted, is just phenomenal. Yeah. yeah am, am I understanding correct that the overall commitment is $8 million, but that's from the fund. Our commitment, if we did all three projects, would be 551 Is that right? Correct, sir. Now, again, just for comparison, because... 531? Yeah, 531.204, and not a penny more, and most <laughs> likely less. Um, and then, again, if you use general funds, again, that's... It's still a pretty good discount, sure, but not as good as the ARP. I mean, they're really obviously pushing that. If you remember, I think Andrea's pillars, you know, one was broadband, and that was kind of the purpose from the from the get go. Um, but again, there's a lot of competition for the ARP mon money. Uh, it's a unique opportunity, like just we talked about the diversion center. The only so, really bad news is it doesn't hit all of the needs. But how many did how many households would it cover? So in those. Three specific proposals. census areas, 2,500 total. But again, the connectivity to it, because they have to have a line that creates a lot more opportunity for folks that maybe just have a, a MiFi that's not great, but then all of a sudden they have fiber level. So it's well, a I big know, jump. Which is an expansion in itself. Yes. Going forward. Yes. 10 years from now. Right. So obviously you build a big highway, they're going to have subroad. It makes it cheaper to do the subroads sure. as well. In other words, we're going to probably, if you take advantage of and we get awarded this, we're going to, some of those areas are going to advance five, 10 years than they would normally be. Well, when you're talking about this, I remember being in New York and we went to a, uh, a community thing because we wanted fiber optic in our, in our neighborhood. Right. And just our block alone was going to cost half a million dollars. Oh, yeah. And we were going to have as we were going to have to pay some as well to get this. But well, and there's been a lot of grants and stuff like that. And when you push it all to just the rural, it the cost per household goes way way up. So this was an attempt to kind of bridge that gap. Of course, there's Elon Musk out there. Yeah. There's other stuff going on there. But you know, it, you know, you, you can make the argument, and pandemic showed it that. You know, having decent internet is almost, you know, vital. I mean, right now, we talked about the mental health. There's a lot of folks that are doing, you know, they're maybe a little concerned about going in, but they'll have a mental health uh, session with folks Tele online, telehealth. telehealth. Yeah, so, you know, it's it's a big deal. So, um, you know. I think it's a big deal that we need to not wait and go ahead and give him the with, with, the, with the return on investment here, that's a no-brainer. And I mean, by May, you say we'll know whether it's accepted We'll know who got awarded, yes. And therefore, if it's not awarded, we haven't spent the money. Right, exactly. You'll come right back to the coffers. Well, and, and one of the purposes for our funds in the first place was to be able to expand broadband. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, my only, my only mm -hmm. problem is we can't go further than we could. Yeah. That's, a, that's another question I was going to let Craig chime in here first. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to ask. 
um, you know, since our funds don't run out for two and a half years, uh, would let's say we land this deal, uh, could could we say maybe next year this time we come back and there may be some more needs that we could? Well, in? again, what we're hearing and we've talked to a lot of, we've been sat in a lot of sessions with other county entities and school government, and mm -hmm. so we're hearing some folks are kind of waiting in the weeds. Some people jumped ahead. Rockingham, again, they don't regret what they did, but they decided that we're going to spend our funds in an RFP. Matter of fact, we were looking at it for a while there. Um, talk to them directly. Um, absolutely, this CAM project that's coming down the pike, again, is additional funding. There'll probably be some kind of match. Yeah. Um, there may be an incentive to use ARP. Next year, there may be more. I mean, every year there is money in this great program. But this year was the big influx, you know, and so I don't, maybe it'll be more. Maybe it'll be so successful and people will do that. I'm not sure. Uh, my other comment, Mr. Chairman, is that we've had numerous conversations trying to reverse this process. That is trying to figure out how to submit an RFP into the world to get providers to bite and not knowing, right. not knowing right. what to ask for. <clears throat> right. Um, and so finally we have the process that we've wanted, which is, Providers coming to us and say we want to do this. I think we jump on this right now. My only question is, do we get to the head of line if, if we send these letters by singing telegram? I mean, what? Do we <laughs> 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 yeah, bro. Show is that you your one? Show <laughs> we'll we'll get you a commitment. We'll get you a nice outfit, bro. <laughs> to this. <laughs> Hey, I mean, for eight million dollars, it's just about doing anything for Alabama <laughs> <laughs> County. So, yeah. I like it. Or I chicken soup. Like too. it. <laughs> Are you think, making a motion? I move that we. I will uh, second it and say it's a no-brainer. <laughs> yeah. Move that we allocate up to five hundred thirty-one thousand two hundred four dollars out of ARP funding uh, to fund these uh, three great grant uh, proposals with appropriate letters. Okay. Yeah. So we'll work with Deborah. I second that motion. That motion. That motion. That motion. Okay. Okay. I've heard that. Are you in the temptation? <laughs> <now? laughs> I must have been. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Y'all get punchy. Any further comment? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Well, I'm, I'm, I just want to clarify that you are also including in your motion, and I think Bruce was starting to go down this road, that you direct he and I to work on writing the letters to the respective companies on your, those commitment letters on your behalf. Amen. Yeah. I thought that right. was part of his motion. Was it, it was. It was implicit in the motion, but yes. It was shortened, but it was in there. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you. Deborah's been a huge help. Mimi's yes. been a huge help. These folks have been a huge help on all this. Again, right. it's a good, it's a win, one of those few win wins, I think. Yes. Sir. So. And we thank you. Yes. We thank you. Thank you so much. Did we vote? Mm -hmm. we haven't voted. We you haven't voted yet. I'm sorry. Not, 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 I okay. haven't voted yet. Okay. Okay. Question. My five calls. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Bruce, for all this work. Yes, nice. Commissioner's Thank you, Bruce. I have all your service at my house. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bruce, Bruce uh, appropriately thanked a lot of folks, and there have been a lot of folks working, but on this broadband issue, he has been the touchstone for county so. government and has stayed on top of this, uh, these things as they've developed, and it was a mad rush uh, last week and over the weekend for him to, to work to put all this together. So, yeah, great, great work. So. Good job. Ms. Cattle? <laughs> I was trying to signal you. <laughs> I need smokes or something. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. thanks. It's not St. Patrick's Day, but close. Right <laughs> um, I'm going to send my piggyback on him. What we have before you tonight is a new cell phone tower down on Bishop Road in Snow Camp area, uh, part of the Alamance County Unified Development Ordinance, Section 6.11, Wireless Communication Facilities Ordinance. All requests for new cell towers over 90 foot in height must be reviewed by Planning Board and must receive approval by Board of Commissioners. Planning Board voted unanimously to recommend approval at their February 24th meeting. There was a slight bit of discussion between the applicant and uh, board members on saving some of the trees along the driveway access. Uh, they, they can speak better to that, but I think they were looking into what they could do with that. Just to give you an idea of where this is, we are uh, down we're down at 6359 Bishop Road, and this is Snow Camp again. They're looking at a 199-foot tower, so that would be over that 90-foot requirement by ordinance. Um, the property's not located in the watershed, no floodplain in the area, no historic properties within 1,000 feet. 
it is a monopole tower so you'll see there's an engineer letter in your packet monopole towers fall differently than original old engineered wireless towers so they've asked for um, a little bit of relief on their fall zone and because of how those towers fall their engineers certify that that would be okay and that's okay by ordinance so you have a copy of that as well You've got some site plan information in there on where it's at, how close it is to the road, and all the things within their uh, fenced-in area. Staff's recommended approval of this. It seems to meet all the requirements of the ordinance. We've been working with these guys for a little while, so um, they are also here for any questions you all may have. Any questions? I can guarantee you they need a tower down there for Yes, sir. They do. do you we received any comments from any citizens down there against this? I have not. And this is a tower, so this is not a specific company. They can bring in three plus. And we also have privileges if we need to be on the tower. Is That's part of our Is it all on private property? Is it? Uh, it is. Mm -hmm. okay. Is this property close to another um, area in Snow Camp that's been more controversial? Is this close to the corner? Somewhat, yes. So all that boom boom won't shake your tower loose? <laughs> I'm just asking. I've seen movies. It will, it will not. We heard about that at the planning board meeting. So they have to meet wind, snow, all kinds of earthquake, all that stuff has to be there. And people above us look at all of that and they have to go through the state and everything to get their approvals. I don't want you to have any surprises. No. Okay. We we're well aware of it. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's take it. Mr. Sutton. Okay, I can do that. This item in your agenda is part of our budget process for fiscal year 22 23. And uh, you're not required to vote on this tonight. This is strictly for your information, is to put it out before you and the public as we work on the capital plan for Alamance County government for next fiscal year. Uh, this document is in your packet. It is posted on the Alamance County Capital Projects website. It's already available for the public. It's a work in progress. The idea will be uh, when the manager's recommended budget is presented in May, it will be a part of that presentation. So I just want to hit a few highlights uh, give you the opportunity to look through it. If you have questions now, great. Uh, we will certainly try to answer them, but if not, uh, it's a simple review. You may have to advance me, Bruce. I think I've, y'all may have ordered oh, a clicker turn, out. Turn on. It, I think it says on. Both directions. In, All right, well, I'll do it. You can run me through. Sure. Thank one you. more time. One yeah, more one more time. <laughs> last, last one, right? It's the pond. <laughs> there we go. So capital plan, we've begun doing those uh, for the past, I believe, at least two years. Uh, and as you know, the county maintains uh, the capital responsibilities for county government courts and ABSS and the community college. And this plan, we have found it to be an implementation tool that keeps up with all the projects that we have and gives us guidance throughout the year and subsequent years too. It includes projects that are of natures that include acquisition, construction, maintenance and repair, the very all varying types of uh, capital projects in this document. It also establishes the financial plan. Our Davenport plan is included in this, uh, in this document too, even though that changes uh, at times throughout the, the fiscal year. And it, it does also adhere to the board's financial and debt management policies. It includes data in it about our technical review committee and our oversight committee about how they're formulated, what, what their roles are when they meet. Uh, the, as I said, the version that you have before you right now is a draft. Uh, it, it will be available for you to consider and approve uh, in June as you approve the budget for county government. And next slide, please, Bruce. Thank you. So just a brief highlight of the, there's a ton of information in this plan, and you can look at it at your leisure. But uh, in the agenda packet, pages 54 through 66, uh, pertain to the meat of the school system's capital information. You would note that for next, according to our financing plan, our large uh, capital uh, multi-year plan for Alamance Burlington School System. The pay-go dollar amount projected for next fiscal year is three million three hundred thousand. That's been their amount for the past two years, and and per our current financial plan that's in place, that continues to be their amount. The uh, discussions with the school system have indicated they'd like to have a consistent dollar amount, and we've been able to do that. 
uh, and can continue to do that uh, under the current financial plan. You will notice in the uh, capital plan we have their top unfunded projects. Uh, it, the total dollar amount is a little over $17.6 million. So that information is in there. Dr. Thorpe sent that. Uh, for, and it is different. It's different because the board has acted on uh, uh, many of the unfunded projects that they had with their capital reserves. You allow them to do that, so they've rolled up their next round of priorities. So you'll be able to see is that. that is that a new top ten? Yes, new top ten. Yes. Can it be nice when they get down below like top three? Yeah. <laughs> not that happens. That's right. Not, not with walking. <laughs> <through. laughs> That's right. Quick okay. question: Is that three point three million tied to anything such as the county's tax base? Uh, no, it's just it, when when the commissioner set the uh, what's five point four zero cents right. for the school systems part of the capital plan, that included all of their new debt service, and it set a dollar amount of three point three million a year. They do have in the capital plan a list of PAYGO projects that they plan for next next fiscal year. So they have given the board an idea of what they're going to do with that three point three million uh, from a project perspective. So. Uh, again, the, we used to be all over the place with the dollar right. amounts that we allocated, right? So you're able to allocate 3.3 million for school system capital. Uh, it's coming out of their capital plan, so you're not having to think about that from an operations right. perspective. So. Um, and there are also education bond projects, summary and year-to-date details included. And, and there's like a page for every education bond project uh, for the school system in the in the packet too, in the plan. Bruce, I think we can go on to the to the next project, the next page. I'm sorry. Uh, it's very similar information for the community college, pages 67 through 76 of the agenda packet. If you care to look tonight, it's where this information is. Uh, the community college's pay go for next fiscal year, set per the parameters of the uh, financial plan that's already in place, would be $388,200 for next fiscal year. So they have included, as ABSS has done in their portion of the capital plan what they plan to do with their PAYGO money too. And then they have, uh, the college has also provided a list of unfunded projects, a little over $7.8 million, but that is also included in this plan. And again, we have a, a page for each of their education bonds. There's a summary page too, where you can see details about each one spending year to date and what's going on with those, uh, with those bond projects. And we can get right on to the next. This is our last slide, commissioners. Uh, the county's capital plan in the packet uh, that you have tonight, 77 through 102, is the pages that uh, include it. And so our uh, county government's pay-go uh, next fiscal year is projected to be 300000 which has been our pay-go uh, for the past, uh, I think this year was the first year because we added additional dollars for the parks department's capital needs. Uh, we do have a list of unfunded projects, and, and that is broken out too. You can look in the county's piece, see what the county is proposing to do with its $300,000 for next uh, fiscal year. Uh, the unfunded project list from county government is also in the uh, capital plan draft that you have, a little over $8.1 million of unfunded county project needs. And there's also uh, a facility, there are three summaries for county government. Facility plan summary, which is uh, uh, our court buildings and all those uh, kind of the, the two campuses. I will say that uh, two of those items are going to be removed from the capital plan by the time it's presented to you in May. The Petrie building w w is finished and uh, will be completely wrapped up. Hope to have a ribbon cutting ceremony in April. And uh, then that, that piece will come out of the capital plan. And the dental clinic, which uh, Tony and the uh, facilities folks have been working very hard on. I've seen lots of really great pictures. They are doing work to parking, lot, water, sewer, and the interior of the building. It's going to look really nice. Those will both be done by the final version, so those projects will not be listed. We also have a section of the county's plan that deals with CECOM uh, uh, technology plan. We've started implementing this as we get more and more needs in our 911 communication center. One of those projects, the VHF project, will also be complete by the time you get the final version in your hand, so it'll be gone. And we've included uh, a landfill plan summary uh, with various projects that the landfill uh, is either planning or in the process of doing. Several of these also will be completed by the time you get the final version of the plan. The new cell permitting and design project, the convenience center asphalt, and the cell 2A liner repair. Uh, Richard's folks have done a tremendous amount of work over the past year to get these and, and many other smaller capital projects, because these were some pretty big capital projects for the landfill. They'll wrap up by the time we give you the final version. 
and in a, the final version of the capital plan, uh, the Davenport financing plan piece will be recalculated by Davenport, and you'll have the newest, most accurate version uh, in the capital plan. It's going to be, I think, uh, some good news that will come out of doing that. But, uh, for example, for some of the county's projects, like the court system, we have not issued the debt as our original schedule called for, right? So we, we, we've delayed and we've taken second looks. That's good news because I think what the board may find is we pick up some debt capacity, right? Uh, so, you know, what we've been talking with the court system about is our original plan was not quite enough, right? It just, it wasn't enough in scope. So I think once Davenport reruns these numbers, we'll give it to you, we'll put it in the plan, you're going to pick up some debt capacity in some of those court-related projects, which will be helpful as you, as you plan on trying to be a little more uh, uh, future-minded when you're doing the court system. So. Uh, again, this doesn't require a vote tonight. These are the very brief highlights of this plan, but it is available uh, on, on the website uh, for folks to look at and for the board to look at, too. So I'm happy to try to answer any questions. I appreciate uh, Andrea and her folks' work on putting this together, and they are going to continue to refine it until it's managers recommended. So. The next item on the agenda. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I know we've kept it a secret that Mr. Haygood may be leaving us uh, sometime before <laughs> the end of the month, but <laughs> uh, but he is retiring. His last day on the job will be March 31st, yeah. which is right around the corner. Um, <laughs> Brian, you've done an excellent job, and you deserve all the pine well, anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we just appreciate everything that you've done. No, it's been a privilege. Now, looking forward, we need to appoint an interim county manager uh, because this last day on the job will be March 31st. Uh, April 1st, we need an interim county manager. Uh, and we have uh, someone sitting over here hiding. <laughs> <laughs> that has uh, worked for us for over 14 years is currently the deputy county manager uh, which is a promotion over the assistant that she previously had uh, she's currently overseeing all the capital projects that we are doing throughout the county and many many other duties um, she is the perfect fit for the interim and I will ask the board at this point for a motion to appoint Sherry Hook as interim county manager until the next county manager begins. I'll make that motion. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous. Aye. Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> Commissioner, last but not least. You, you right. notice I always say, yes, sir. I don't ever mention names. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so before you is a uh, budget. goes fast. <laughs> before you is a budget memory request in the amount of $215,614. This is uh, federal funds that's being passed through the state um, onto the local health department. No local, no local match is required. No out-of-state travel is required. Um, this is for COVID-19 school health programs, really specific to school nursing and school-based social workers. The health department does not employ uh, school nurses, so we plan on passing this money through to ABSS. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. And the next one before you is another budget amendment in the amount of $19,059 for our WIC Women, Infant, and Children program. This is a fully federal, um, federally funded program. Um, they've actually maintained a caseload of 113% over the last year. So this is additional money um, coming from the federal government so we can uh, continue to offer those uh, extended services there. And that will be used for uh, continuing to contract with uh, registered uh, dietitians and some of their program supplies. And there's no uh, no cost match and no out, of state, no out of state travel is required. Basically just a pass for it. Mm -hmm. It's straight from the federal government through the state onto us and continues yeah. to help fund right. the program. Yeah. Any discussion? All in favor, signify, we need a motion. Motion to approve. <laughs> Second. 
A motion to second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, sir. I won't mention your name either. All everybody knows is Susan Evans. <laughs> Good evening, commissioners. Um, before you tonight, I'm bringing two budget amendments. The first one will increase the county's budget by $1.1 million. That will is what we are expected to receive back from FEMA in this fiscal year. So that would be a breakdown of for COVID-19 response, that's our PPE that we're purchasing, COVID tests, things of that nature, 500,000, and with our vaccination clinics, 600,000. Motion to approve. Second. <laughs> All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Again, unanimous, thank you. Thank you. And the second one I have for you tonight would be to consider increasing our occupancy tax budget by $435,754. Um, we have seen an uptick in collections. We're almost back to where we were pre-pandemic. Um, so we are really seeing an increase there. We're inspecting, uh, and that's just based on the first seven months, um, not even back into the springtime when we saw increased travel last year. So what we are asking for you to do right now is to increase that budget. And what that will allow is it will increase the amount, the two thirds of the collection that goes to the TDA by $290,503. And then we have four outside agencies that are funded through the occupancy tax. Those being the African American Cultural Arts and History Center, Alamance Arts, the Alamance Historic Museum, as well as Glencoe Textile Museum. Our budget is budgeted in such a way that these funds are distributed to them based on the actual collections. So when we did our initial budget, it was based on the reduced amount in total of 278,000. This would then increase those budgets by $145,251. Those funds, again, I'll stress, they are not distributed unless we collect that amount. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Again, unanimous. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We are now down to public speakers. I know all the public speakers are glad <laughs> finally there. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, Mr. Russell. Well, good evening. Good evening. How you doing? I'm Darrell Russell. I live at 1526 McCray Road, Burlington. That is in the northern part of the county. Yep. Nice place. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you tonight. I'll get right to it. I'm here to ask the county to develop, adopt, and implement an outdoor shooting range ordinance. And I'm not asking this because I'm against guns. I own guns. And I support the Second Amendment. My issue is about the excessive noise that comes from shooting ranges in general. But there, there is one <coughs> that's recently opened about a mile from my house. As I call it the crow flies. There have been reports of stray bullets from that range. So the need for an ordinance is from an excessive noise issue and safety concerns. Now at times this range sounds like a war zone. Y'all probably heard people say that before about shooting ranges. And occasional, occasionally there's a loud boom that sounds like dynamite. I don't know what's going on. But it will rattle the dishes in our house over a mile away. I'm not exaggerating. The range has few measures to reduce the impact of noise from guns. But they do require their customers to wear earplugs. And I think that's kind of ironic that the shooting range protects their customers' ears. But I'm just going to say it doesn't appear 
that they have much concerns for the neighbors. You know, there are other areas in the county that also need protection from rangers, not just where I live. And there's more coming. You know, Alamance County is no longer a rural county. We have new developments going up all over the place. There are new developments out close to where I live. You know, the excessive noise is also a hindrance to property sales, and it can adversely affect property values. Other counties in the state have outdoor shooting range ordinances. It's not new. There's probably more than, than you think. And these ordinances, they have teeth in them. I have talked, I've talked to the sheriff department a little about it. And he says that our current Norris ordinance just does not have the teeth that a standalone I'm sorry. ordinance would have. Yes, sir. Thank you. Is my three minutes up? Yes, sir. Thank Man. you for your time. I mean, I'm sorry. It flies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to come tonight to speak with us. I'm sitting here for two and a half hours waiting on us. <laughs> That's very true. Yeah. McCombie? Is that the correct? Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, would it be appropriate to uh, distribute a handout? Please. Yes. Yeah. It would really be okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Peter Morkin. I'm here to represent FREE, which stands for Financial Reform for Excellence in Education. What we do is we build public schools with private money. And um, I came before you in October very cheekily asking you for $2 million. <laughs> uh, this time you'll be happy to know I'm not asking for money. <laughs> I want to talk to you about the River Mill Academy and the Clover Garden Schools, which are two of the schools I helped to found, with 1,500 students. Two weeks ago, the River Mill Academy had a lottery. Now, this is a large school, so you'd expect there to be 100 seats available next August. But actually, there were 12. And uh, the problem with that is that there were 407 applicants for 12 seats. And what I call this is lottery anguish. Imagine you're one of the 407. You didn't get a seat, did you? So, or most of you didn't. And over the years, a lot of parents have just given up putting their names forward. So the true demand is probably higher than the 400. And then you add the other schools, Clover Garden and Hall Bridge. There's easily a thousand students or a thousand families looking for a charter school place today. Now, the school that I want to open is called the Unity Global Academy. It will open in Graham in August of 2023. But there's a small window of opportunity uh, that if we got approval within the next 30 days, we could open it this year, in August or September of this year and offer 450 places, how am I doing? Um, <laughs> 450 places, um, and all I need is a letter from you gentlemen, uh, and uh, that would have greatly improve my chances of getting ch a charter approved. I would make an emergency application. Normally these things are turned down, but with your backing, I think I've got a sporting chance. Anyway, that's... Uh, I hope you'll think about it. Thank you, Mr. Markham. We do appreciate it. Okay, there are no other speakers. Um, are there commissioners' responses? I do. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'd like just to make a couple of comments on uh, the last speaker. Um, wow, I'm impressed. 
Um, you know, we don't normally have individuals come in in front of us and tell us that they can build us a school and it doesn't cost us any money. In five months. In five months. And you can take care of the needs that are out in the community. And your numbers uh, speak volumes about what's out there in the community. And I've had folks reach out to me, hey, what can I do to get my, my kids in a charter school? Uh, I think what you're doing is, and, and you, you, have, you have a track record. You've done this before. This ain't it's your first rodeo, so to speak. And River Mill, I'm have quite familiar with River Mill. It's an incredible school. And you started it with no money from the local government. And I, at some point, I would like you to, uh, I don't know how we would do this, but I would certainly like you to be able to have a, a location or a place that you could tell folks, show people what you have done and how you did it. Uh, I, I'm just totally amazed that you can actually do this with no funding from the local government. Now, that just, you know, I'm, when I say this, we're in the process of building a school, a hundred plus million dollars for a high school, for a thousand students. So when you say that need is for a thousand students, I'm just, you know, I applaud you and I, I certainly hope that this board can see the value that Mr. Morcom adds here and we should we should try to work with him and see what we can do. Because this is a this is a situation that I don't I've never seen in my life. That someone takes money out of their own pocket and starts a school and the and the community gets to have the all the additions and all the, the great things that go along with the school, friendship, camaraderie, sports, and it costs nothing. Is that a motion for a letter of support? I would certainly make a motion for a letter of support right now. I think it's almost incumbent upon us to like at least try this. And it's no need to try it. It's been done before. It's been done twice, correct? Well, we did six, but two oh. now and that's counted. Um, I applaud Alamance your community efforts. Schools, the charter school, is that one Alamance Community School up on Hall River? Uh, Clo uh, Clover Garden. Uh, it's nothing to do with me. Right. Uh, I, although I did lease that, that, that building, the space that they occupy, I leased that from Ronnie Jordan 22 years ago. And uh, the River Mill Academy went in there, and then it moved to Graham. Mm -hmm. And when one charter school moves out, another one moves in. Yep. So that's how Hall Bridge got their building. And you say you've done six of these. Yes. Six. What's your window on when you need a letter? 30 days. You need a letter in 30, 30 days. days. Well, the quicker the better. Yes, sir. Uh, is, it, is it proper here to be asking uh, Deborah if this is possible or our law folks? Deborah, would you like to comment? Um, you know, it's hard to say. I don't know enough about it to, to give you advice at this point. I think it's always better to make sure we research things Understood. Um, from a legal perspective before I give advice. No. Okay. Um, I would just like to make a comment about public school. Um, public school doesn't have a lottery. Public school doesn't accept you. Everybody is allowed to go to public school no matter what your situation is, your disability is, um, your issues, IEPs, everything. No one can be turned away from public school. Um, many times people think charter schools are private schools, but they're not. They're funded through the taxpayers. It's just a different thing with a lottery. And God bless them. I think everybody has a right to go to the kind of school that best suits them and their family. And that's just the way it's supposed to be. But as a, um, when I, I know stats, and I'm just gonna say this, a school is a building. It has brick, it has mortar, it has parking lots, it has classrooms, it is a building. What walks into that school determines that school. And if a school is located in a high poverty zone, high crime zone, unfortunately that may come into there. And I'm gonna side with the kid that may not live in the best home that does their best just to get in the door. 
And so I want anybody to go to the school where they want to, but I will not sit here and let anybody think that one school is better than the other because um, when you have strong PTOs, you got a strong school. When you have lack of parent support, you have a hard school to teach at. We've seen the stress and anxiety. My daughter's a teacher. What they went through with remote, we've solved decisions that all of us can say we wouldn't have made, but we weren't in those shoes. And so I hope that this is a come true for you, sir. I really do. I was at the roasted coffee shop today, and I heard your entire conversation on speaker to Mr. Lashley. That means everybody that walked in the coffee shop heard it too. And you didn't even know I was a commissioner, did you, till you saw me tonight. And that's okay. That's all right. But I'm just saying, as a, um, as a parent who had three children to go through the public school system, and I'm very proud of them. They made good choices. That's the key. Um, the issue with everything right now is the home. So I'm not going to let public school get beat up because they're going to have some low scores, because they're going to have some troubled kids. we got troubled kids everywhere. And I will tell you this, serving on JCPC and being on the school board, some of the wealthiest schools in our system had some of the most issues with drugs. So don't be thinking, I've watched Graham and Cummins be beat up all the time because of this. And they were the lowest ones reports of crime. And so don't make me call out schools, because I know this. I was on the board for eight years and I did the appeals and the transfers and I seen the horrible situations that some kids walk into. So I'm gonna always be on the side of the kid. Kids are many times a product of their home and it is not their fault. As they get older, they got to know the difference between right and wrong. We do everything we can to help children, just like I do everything I can to help people with addiction. It's still up to them, but I do appreciate you coming here. But as a, as a former board member, I'm going to stand up for ABSS because I know what they go through. I know what our teachers have gone through. If anybody needs mental health support, it is our teachers because of what they've had to endure this last couple of years. I have seen my daughter cry on the way home because she felt like she was failing her class. So, and it was just the circumstances. So, um, God bless charter schools. Many of my friends go there and I will stand by them any day. But I'm going to always stand by public school because they don't deny anybody anything. Kids can go to 21 years old with physical injuries, physical problems because that is an enormous support system for the family. And don't you know that was a whole eye opener when it comes to being on remote for that and autistic children, ESL, it's been a nightmare for everybody. And it was nobody's fault but a virus, whatever that looks like. And so, uh, and I'm not picking on you, sir, but sometimes, you know, um, it's just easy to point our fingers at everybody else and we just need to point fingers at ourselves sometimes. And I'm preaching to myself. But um, I know how hard public school works, and I know how hard kids work. And sometimes they just get handed a bad deal when it comes to their address at home. And so I will stand by that all day long. But, Ms. Thompson, you do understand that the parents in that bad address are the ones reaching out to folks like him. Well, I hope happen. they do. Because they're they trying to pull the ripcord out of the public schools because they understand the public schools is failing their child. And they're not just sitting here waiting, waiting, waiting. They're looking at gentlemen like him who make it happen who don't just take the status quo as being okay. The sc public schools are what the public schools have always been, and there's a lot of things in the public schools that you and I can't change. Teachers, we can't change them readily. Uh, they have a lot, a lot of things that we can't do. Think about the teachers union. Let's go back two years ago. Let's go through this COVID stuff. Look what the teacher union have served up. We don't have a union. I know. In Alex County. Yes, so we, we do. Can, we yes, got, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Bill, this we, is where me and you're going to split. Because what, I'm going to tell you right they now, do we have, have a, a union in Alamance County. We do have a union. We do not have a union are, like they have in Chicago. Who are, who, are the folks, who are the folks that show up and say that There's they're... There's about a handful of ADA unions. So who are they? Well, they're not a union, so to speak. So why are they, they calling themselves We don't have a sheriff to call you guys. I don't need a sheriff, but I'm going to stand by public school all I can. I'm also going to stand by charter school. You don't need to defend anything, sir. You had your three minutes. No, no. just wait. Could I make a suggestion? No. No, right now it's not a suggestion, and we will disagree to agree. Sure, but sure. But I, I just think that you need to think about the person that's in that home that you say is so bad 
They're reaching out to him. They're not reaching out to public school. They're not reaching out to public school. Hey, help me, help me, help me. They're asking me to get out of this public school. And there's a reason for that. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's what they do. I don't have kids. Well, I, that's, that's exactly right. And that's by design. That And that is exactly right. That's and that by is your design. choice. But maybe you start, need to start going with me to JCPC and getting a reality of what now our I youth is. You too take that out in the whole way. No, because this is, we're, on, we're commissioners. We're elected. And we have a right to disagree on stuff like this. And Ms. it's Tegan, okay. Yeah, I still love Ms. you. Ms. Tegan, I ask that staff research this issue and come back for our April 4th meeting. Certainly. Thank you. And thank you, Pam. I appreciate it. Thanks. I think that's the first time we've gotten a fight. I don't think it's a fight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't see any blood over there, so it's no. not a fight yet. We're fine. County yeah. manager's report. Mr. Hey, good. Uh, one thing I would mention, commissioners, is uh, I've had an opportunity to talk with uh, <laughs> Clerk Frank about our boards and committee process, about uh, the, the way we solicit applications, the way we uh, put those applications together for the commissioners to consider. And I think it would be uh, in the best interest of the citizenry and of the board if we come back in the month of April, uh, talk a little bit with the legal staff too about this, and perhaps at the second meeting in April, with a recommendation to the commissioners about how we might be able to do that in a way that's a little more streamlined, more efficient for the citizens, easier for them to uh, apply and easier for our staff to review those and provide them to you in a timely manner where you get an opportunity to review them and be a part of the, a part of the process uh, from our office's perspective. So I just wanted to touch base with the commissioners about this. Uh, be looking for a recommendation from uh, county management and the clerk's office uh, dealing with um, uh, boards and committees process and a appointment structure in the next month. So, thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. All right, at this point, under Commissioner's comments, um, I am pleased to announce that the county is uh, has recommend or is recommending Heidi York as the new county manager, uh, effective uh, July first of 2022. Ms. York uh, has worked for over two decades in local government um, and so forth, has worked in Person County for more than 13 years um, and has done an outstanding job in the position as county manager. Um, to be honest, she talked about being here today and we wanted the emphasis to be on some hey good guys. <laughs> <laughs> and so she has agreed not to appear today. Um, but I would ask for a motion to appoint Heidi York as Alamance County's manager effective July 1, 2022. Motion to approve. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor signify by saying uh, aye. 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 Opposed, no. All right, we have one opposed and four yeas. Yes. Okay. I don't have anything else under uh, commissioner's comments. Do any of the other members? Mr. Carter. Um, we, we, we talked about this, I think, back in January, and I, I'm not sure it came up in February, but we've been talking about this before, and we have a lot going on. We have a lot. We get a, we get a, an agenda on, Friday, on Thursday evening normally, and uh, trying to catch up with it, a lot of times there are items on the agenda that we don't have any insight into, and we have to try and do our back study and our homework. And I just, uh, I just, I, I've, I've had some conversations with some of our, so with some of my associates here, and I just feel like, well, I think I've talked with all of you about this really, but I just feel like we really need to take a look at some sort of regular work session where we can work through discussing some of these things, have some things presented to us with out being required to take a vote, be able to have some homework we can take home and study and make sure that when when we come in to take a vote, we're fully prepared for it without having to try and scramble for it over a weekend. We well, obviously have, have done that uh, in the past we on did at least one occasion. Yeah. Our work session worked really well with the Board of Education because we could talk about everything. Very seldom do we have a vote, but it really prepped us for the night meeting um, to really understand not just the topic and a quick presentation. We really had a chance to talk it out and see where we're coming from. 
and um, and the directors that present that um, always appreciate it because they could give every insight that they had and we were able to really ask those questions um, just that's just my opinion I agree with Steve I think it's case by case dependent uh, I mean I think we've talked in the past about a, a process for making determinations about our funding that's more strategic um, I would support this idea specifically related to the remaining ARP funding um, so that we can can get a sense of, of what kind of priorities the board might have based on input from from others uh, so I think it's case by case dependent I, I think it makes sense in the current uh, environment to do that with respect to ARP funding well, that was that was another thought we talked about too was uh, definitely taking the time to get a focus and maintain a current focus on where we are and where we need to go with our funds. I mean, it's a lot of money. We want to do it right. Yeah. Mr. Lashley, any comments? Oh, I completely agree. I think it's uh, well worth the time. Okay, I'll, I'll take the last shot, hopefully. <laughs> uh, I, I agree. I don't know that we need to have work sessions every meeting. Uh, at the same time, uh, particularly for appointments, Mr. Turner, you pointed that out earlier uh, at our last meeting. I think we need to have um, some prior notice as to when appointments are up and coming and uh, a lot more information about the <coughs> candidates and things of that sort uh, and time to review those before meetings. So I think what everyone has is agreeing to should happen. And so, Mr. Hager, we're going to ask you to direct our interim county manager <laughs> to bring proposals to us. Will do. Thank you. Um, I would just like to say something to you, Brian. <laughs> I've dreaded this the whole night. I'm sorry. Um, I just want to thank you for being the person you are. I've had a whole year of you, and you're amazing. Anytime I asked you to go look at a, a trash heap, a septic tank, um, you even went with me to Kansas City to see an amazing project. And I saw a side of you that I, people might not get to see here because you were just all marine. And it, we, it was an amazing, amazing trip. And um, it was, I look at, um, I just, I look at how you've been my um, real champion on that. And um, I don't know how that's gonna turn out and I have great concerns for the homeless vet. I look at Ukraine right now and there are soldiers get deployed and they're all over there. I looked at Afghanistan, how that was just a nightmare, and our soldiers were there. Some come home, some didn't. And I have such a heart for um, that soldier that's come back with a lot of damage that just can't get their life back. And we saw how that project in Kansas City, they're going four builds right now, and how they have mastered it, and they are unbelievable at raising money. And I've had to feel like a Lone Ranger on this sometimes, and I don't know what I would have done without you. You know, I look every day, um, they're trying their best to get my son to re-enlist. It's such a nightmare of time right now in this world. And we just don't know from day to day. And we watch the media and we see them talk about people dying over there like it's the news and it's not real. And we, and just people's emotions are raw. I think that's where I'm at today. I'm just I'm wore out with it. And, um, and we talk about mental health. We're getting ready to drop millions on a mental health building which I work with it every day. That's, that's my job, is working with total brokenness and people with drugs and sex abuse and domestic violence. It's all in the same ugly bucket. But we need to think about the mental health of these soldiers that raise their hand to protect us so we can sit here without bombs dropping outside this building because they matter. They really matter to me. And um, I don't know what I would have done without you because you didn't think twice. I watched how the National Guard stepped up with Tony giving shots. I mean, they probably think, what in the world? I didn't join the service to do this. I watched them guard the Capitol. I've watched them be took everywhere, and they always show up. And I think it's really important that our county always shows up for them, because without them, we might not be sitting here safe. We might not have anything to eat. We may not be free in the United States of America. And so I can't ever thank you enough for the last year with you. You are a class act. And, um, it's just going to be different. I don't doubt Sherry Hook one bit. She's amazing. And she's much prettier. 
<laughs> so, uh, nothing personal, but yeah, she I, is. So I gotta agree with that. And um, <laughs> I, that's some kind of harassment. Just get that clear, Deborah. And so, uh, but um, you gotta watch everything you say now. And um, but I'm just appreciate more than you know what you have done for this county and how you take care of us. And any time I've called, you've just been a marine. And um, that that says everything about your character. And I just hope we've lived up for you, because we're a hot mess. I know I am. I mean, and, um, and I just appreciate you, and I will miss you because um, you're just a real rock for this community. You have presence when you walk in, and everybody knows when Brian's here, it's going to be all right. And I know Sherry's going to be the very same way. And so um, I'm sorry. This is just difficult. And, um, and for the caller who says I'm emotional and you're going to call in tomorrow at Top Line, meet me in an alley because I am over you. And so, um, but I appreciate my commissioners and I know we all are so blessed to have had a year with you. And you are as great as you are because of the team under you. It is not just you. And, um, and I know you're honored to work with these people as well. So that's all. I'm sorry. Well, Pam. It's all good. I've had three and a half years with him. Yeah. And I'm going to say to you exactly what I tell anybody that asks me. I can't think of a single time I've ever called you with a problem or with an, in need of an answer that in many cases you didn't have the answer off the top of your head. That's pretty phenomenal. And if you didn't have the answer, I usually got it back from you before the day was out. If it was late in the day, I got it back the next morning. That, I know we have an amazing staff, but we have an amazing leader for that staff. Now, we have we, we've committed to a new county manager, and I believe she's going to be everything we think she's going to be. But I will challenge her. She has big shoes to fill, in more than one way, by the way. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I've seen your feet. I, <laughs> she has some big shoes to fill, but she does. I mean, you're, you're, you are, having never had a, a county manager before you, I can't compare you to anybody else, but I can tell you that in my mind, you're the best. Y'all are too kind. Lots of, lots of hard working folks here. And uh, as I said, it's been a privilege to serve and to serve this board. And I've appreciated each one of your passions and your commitments. You have different interests, and but they're all the interests of the citizens. I have seen that with my own eyes. And uh, the citizens are fortunate to have the type of representation that you are giving them. And I commend you for that. This is a difficult job. I get to see your difficulties that I think citizens don't get to see. And uh, you do it admirably, and it made it easy for me to do this job. And I've appreciated the opportunity, so thank you. Thank you, our pleasure. Here we have the county attorney's report. Yes, so you may recall a couple months ago, I reported to you on the status and update of the national opioid litigation. Um, and at that time, I was pleased to report that North Carolina had met for our state the threshold of having sufficient counties and cities um, sign on to the settlement with the, the four defendants that had we've been negotiating with to settle. That includes the Marisource Burton, Cardinal Health, McKesson, and uh, Jansen, also known as uh, Johnson Johnson. I am pleased to report to you tonight that enough states across the country uh, did meet the threshold in time so that those defendants are going to settle. So that means we will be getting some money that has not finally been determined yet, uh, but money will be coming to Alamance County, uh, we hope as soon as midsummer. The other thing I wanted to share with you uh, is that we uh, have a new assistant county attorney. Her name is Reagan Oakley. Um, she is an Alamance County native. She resides in Burlington where she has lived most of her life. Reagan attended Wingate University where she majored in human services. She later attended Elon University School of Law where she served as the editor in chief of the Elon Law Review. 
Uh, Reagan graduated summa cum laude and received the David Gergen Award for Leadership and Professionalism, as well as the Marshall Thompson Award for Outstanding Achievement in Constitutional Law Studies. After law school, she began her career clerking for then Associate Justice Paul Newby at the North Carolina Supreme Court. She continued her time at the Supreme Court, serving as legal counsel to Chief Justice Paul Newby, where she worked on a variety of criminal, civil, and complex business cases. Reagan's very excited to serve Alamance County as Assistant County Attorney and looks forward to serving the board, employees, and community in the county where she was born, raised in, and is her home. And she will start May 2nd. May 2nd. And I have nothing else to report. And we thank you. <laughs> Mr. Haygood, I agree. That's that's wonderful news. Thank yep. you. Yes. No, my agreement is thank you. Mm -hmm. I served with a, a previous county manager. Um, you are the tops. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. And motion second. All in favor say aye and leave. Aye. <laughs> <laughs>Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on Local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.